So I'm just recapping because you said some of your mates we should wait for them. I'm recapping what we're doing last week so that I can lead to us where I'm going. So we discussed and I mentioned that um, there are different things that can influence your data collection. Apart from the obvious issues about your skills and your resources like financial resources and time, there are other things like the, which is fundamental to the work that the research gaps and purpose objectives and research questions you're trying to answer because those are the ones that your questionnaire will try to address if your questionnaire has not a way has no way of linking back to your research question or objectives then you are not actually doing a good work then your theory sometimes your theory or the conceptual framework itself that you itself that you build out of your theory or your combination of your theory and your Alicia review is going to be the one that will guide you to collect data because the conceptual framework is is a framework that tries to postulate certain um, relationships between variables as the okay okay in okay in, in the reality in order to explain a phenomenon. So that particular suggestions that it's making, you are going to test it, and the relationship between the construct that it has mentioned or uh, it is it is actually trying to describe are the ones but that you to put measure so you have to collect data on, on them then if you are doing a, a single case study it will tell you how much far how much work you need to do in terms of collection of data when you multiple it means you have to collect different different uh, sets of data then the boundary of the data source where the data is being collected from the time that you're collecting the data how far will you go in terms of accessing the res respondents Okay, so with the cost of that, I talked about the questionnaire. The questionnaire is the fundamental instrument that will be used to collect the data. Now, a questionnaire is not a data collection method. Most of the students will confuse that. They say, well, what method are you using? I'm using questionnaire. Every, con every data collection approach will use a questionnaire, whether you are doing survey, you are doing interviews, you are doing um, focus group discussions, you are doing observation, you are doing um, artifact examination, where you are evaluating uh, an artifact or an, an object that somebody has created, mm -hmm. whether physical or abstract, you are going to still have a, a questionnaire to be able to guide you in collecting data. Good. So the questionnaire is an instrument, not not a, a data collection strategy or method. Students confuse that one with the method. So they, if they are doing survey, they say, oh, survey is my, methodolo my methodology and uh, my collection method is, is, uh, is questionnaire. But no, questionnaire is an instrument for collecting data. And it can serve both qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods. So we'll get to know about that. So um, apart from that, uh, research It's very, 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 very disrespectful if you come and then you are disturbing the whole class. So if I see anybody doing that, I'll just take the person out of the class. Okay. So the, what is the impact of mobile? So your, your research questions can also guide you in, in what you collect data on. Now, if you look at the question here, it's about mobiles and micro trading activities of micro market traders. That means your questionnaires will have a target audience of market traders primarily. And then it also has to ask questions as the boundary being on mobiles and micro trading activities. We are not interested in mobiles and their social lifestyle. We want mobiles and their micro trading activities. So there are, there are limits of the research in what you are trying to look for. Then we look at it, when we look at the um, examine the research framework itself, or the conceptual framework of the research, it tells you different stage, uh, different phases of, of occurrence of a phenomenon. It starts from the trader goes to a mobile phone, pre-trade, during trade, post-trade. And then so the cash of the trader matters. Um, um strategic benefits, financial benefits, operational, incremental transformation and production. So now we can even narrow down from just the earlier point that we learned from um I mentioned earlier in the research questions that can inform your can inform your questionnaire. But now that you have the research theory or the conceptual framework or the research model they are going to use, you now know the specifics of what questions to ask and how detailed you want to be. So this is an example of a um a data that has been collected, and you realize that from the paragraph one, the data is about the the business 
that um, Grace runs. Uh, paragraph two is about mobile phones usage. Paragraph and then paragraph two B. That's the quotations coming from Grace, and then another last paragraph telling you about quotations also come from Grace, but now emphasizing something else. So now you realize that each of these things is sharing some information that's relevant to the case study, and that's what you do. You collect data that's relevant to what you are trying to you are trying to study. So in terms of structure, very good case studies always have a, a case profile that tries to explain the background of the case and then try to situate um, what the people, what is involved in whoever is engaged. For example, if you are doing a study on Ministry of Communication, you will have to spend some time explaining what the Ministry of Communication is about. A lot of them will form into your, will be part of your case context. And then after that, you narrow down to the phenomenon. Maybe you are interested in the 2000 and, um, five uh, World Cup and Ghana's performance day. So then that's the scenario. Then the phenomenon you study then becomes of value after you have explained the contents of the of, um, the, the institution that you are focusing on. Okay. So in 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 your work in in doing this work, if whatever you choose to do, you always have to understand that without the context, people can't understand what you're doing. So for example, if I'm trying to do um, the study, or maybe Ghana's performance on in, in 2005 World Cup, I may not use that one to begin the my case profile. I will give my in my in my friend profile. I'll talk about maybe black stars and give them background of black stars. What are black stars is what they have achieved so far. But when I come to my background of the phenomenon, the phenomenon I'm interested is maybe the 1992. Um, it's an African Cup of Nations, and that's what I will start talking about. So, when did how far has Ghana attended Ghana African Cup of Nations? When was the last time that we uh, attend um, um, when there? Why is the 1992 one of very specific focus for this study? Then, when I get to case phenomenon, then I begin to explain the 1992 uh, um, um, uh, African Cup of Nations, maybe the finals. That's what I'm interested in. So, who played the final shot? What was the mood like? What was the environment like? Why did Ghana lose that much? Something like that. These are the issues that are going to case phenomenon. So by the time you come and read the case, even if you don't know about football, because of the fact that I gave you a background of the contest, it gives you understand. It makes you understand who uh, Ghana Ghana um, Black Stars are, and then because of the fact that I've also given you a background to the phenomenon, how many that African Cup of Nations? How long? When was this first instituted? How many times have Ghana participated before 1992? And what 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 is it about? What are the key events that take place? Then the case phenomenon becomes my Ghana's participation, or Ghana's performance, or Ghana's whatever happened to Ghana in the finals. If that was my one to study. So you have got a you have got a contest. <clears throat> I've got a phenomenon, I've got a case phenomenon, the background to the phenomenon, the case phenomenon. This is a very good way of structuring a case study. And I'll use more examples as we go on today. I just want to give an overview of what we did. So in the firm profile, you're going to give us who the organization is, what the organization does. Sometimes you may even give structure if it's relevant. And for a PhD, it may be, you may be writing more. So you end up, you can go to the issues of achievements, resources, financial performance, if all these are relevant to your work. Then I mentioned that in trying to establish this information, you need to collect data. So you need to establish boundary. Now, how far will you go for the data you're looking for? And I was trying to tell you the respondents can be coming from different sectors, different, uh, there are different categories of respondents. And I, I tried to emphasize that the respondents are those who have direct knowledge of the phenomenon, those who are the 1992, game for Ghana, the finals, the witnesses themselves. So they have direct knowledge of the of the of the phenomenon. Others have got indirect um, indirect. So maybe they were there, but they were not on the soccer field. Or they were on the soccer field, but they were not the Grimes playing. The actual people were playing were the footballers. So the footballers can then in that case will be closer to the phenomenon than what the indirect people may have. Then there are those who are external to the institution and then those are cross-boundary. So extend out to the institution, but maybe the opposing team, or maybe other officials of, 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 
of of CAFDAS um, and of CAFDAS, I think, uh, Confederation of African Football, if I'm right. Um, all the all the officials are part of, are outside the Ghana football team, so they are off are not part of the Ghana football team, but they they do take decisions that are relevant. Then across boundary, those who are seem to be internal and external, like an old player. In, recently, there was an um, a discussion that old players like um, I think Sibna Pia can come and give morale to Ghanaian footballers while they are preparing towards the 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 World Cup. So they will not play, but they will be in them because of their experience. They can share experiences and be able to address the fears and then the challenges that the young players may be facing. So that is a direct experience. So he's sharing the experience and it's cross boundary. He's external and internal at the same time. Despite these things, the respondents can also be time related or event based. Event based means something happens and that's why they came together. Or time related, maybe a particular point in time, a particular time of the year, um, these people become this particular data set becomes or data source become more accessible. Okay. Then transitional. Some something that is more transitional, I mean that goes through time and it changes. So you may at the time you're collecting data it could be different from what you experienced a few weeks ago. Okay. Then there's a snowball responder, the one that you talk to that who can refer you to another person. So an example of this is a breakdown like this, and we expect that people should students should bring down their work for us to know who and who they have interviewed. Okay. okay, so if you break it down, you're going to have the participant, the role, and then the cases that the, the you collected data based on that. Now, one category can also add, which is not tied to any of the like pub one is public sector institution one, public sector institution two, private sector institution one, private sector institution two. What if we are just talking to regulators in the industry? It will not fall under any of the private or public. So you may have to add another column and call them regulators. Okay. Now there are different sources of data. There is the documentation, which is written. Then there's audiovisual, which could be social media based content. And then there's participant and non participant um, observation. In terms of observation, you can go there and watch and then you can participate in the activity or you can choose not to participate and just observe. So there's participant and non-participant, um, and pass, uh, non-participant observation, sorry. They have got interviews that kind of have focus groups into, and then focus groups are for groups that you more, usually more than um, average around four to about 12. Some say the ideal size is six to eight anyway. But the idea is to put people who have got homogeneous uh, 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 characteristics and put them together to share their views concerning an issue. Okay. Then you also have product or service examination where you can take a fiscal product or a, a service which is online and then and actually understand it and try to appreciate all the issues that go to it. So this is an example of data collected from the field, which is categorized in, it's a financial data about um, concerning the cost of handsets and the financial profile of a company. So you could actually see that all of these things are captured to display the information for others to be able to relate to it. Then they also have the website being, where you can, the whole, act, the whole website is an artifact. So you can examine it and by breaking it down to pieces. So if you look at here, you've got a, online catalog, advanced search, all of these labels are trying to let you show emphasize functionality. Others can also use logic or process models to show us how something works. And then you sometimes others also use maps. They take maps and pictures of what's on the ground and add it for, um, use it to be bring to relevant discussion within the work that they are trying to do. Now, despite all of these things, because you are going to do interviews, you expect direct quotes from people who you are working with. So here you have Antia Kosia and Grace, all of them trying to make a case, a case for um, the use of mobile phones and then what they use it, what they use it for. So the one from Antia Kosia is up, the one for Grace is also down here. Okay. Sorry. Now it, it means that it's not always that you have to collect it um, 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 
in respondents feedback which are positive sometimes they may be negative but they will be relevant responses that may give you new ideas concerning how to do things and these direct respondents that you this quote that you take from directly from respondents don't only report the good ones also report the ones which are fairly not favorable so that you could be able to make insights draw insights from them so because sometimes the person the respondents respond is not at you but to the institution or to whichever situation you're responding to okay now when you have finished your work one thing that you would have done is that you would have been using a case study protocol which defines how you're going to collect data and then how your data is going to be structured So now we have the case study protocol and then the case study database. The database is more after you've collected the data and you're indexing and trying to remember where you collected everything from. Now, both of approaches are relevant for establishing reliability of your work. So that when somebody picks this, um, um, these notes up, he can be able to, to a large extent, try to replicate your, your study. Now, so this is, an example of this is an example of um these are example uh, the key issues in the collecting data. But now let's move to more of the practical part of being on the field. What actually happens? So we are going to start with the first thing a student will have to do to understand how to be able to do his work, especially when he's collecting data, is to know who is going to collect, where he's going to collect data, and what's the type population of those people. So where's the context? You have to establish the context in which you're going to collect your data and then establish your data collection method and establish a sample. Now, in here, it looks like establishing contest population and data collection and sample means that it looks like the sample is the last one, but that's not necessarily mean so. These things can be done concurrently depending on your expertise and skill. So let's try to look at what happens. So there are four forms of qualitative data. There is observation, which breaks into participant and non-participant. Then there's interview, which can be closed interviews or open interviews. And it can also be group interviews. Then there's documents and text, which some of them are public, some of them are private. And some of them too may be uh, public, but through a secured access. And audiovisual, that one is quite straightforward. Now, when you want to do your study, the first thing you have to try to do is to establish context. Where are you going to collect your data from? Where are you going to collect your data from? Okay. Now, your data collection simultaneously, okay, simultaneously with your analysis and your interpretation throughout the study. So as you're collecting your data, you are actually analyzing at the same time because you are making insights of it to be able to know, okay, this one will go here, this one will go to this label, this go to this category, this is an answer for this particular question, this is an answer for this particular question. That process is a way of analyzing because you are categorizing the data. Now, the first thing that you need to be able to do is to try to appreciate why should that place that you have selected be selected? Justify then how will you gain permission for assessing that site? Okay. What should be done on that site? Okay. And how will the researcher avoid disrupting the normal routine so that you don't interfere with the current activities there? And what will be the du duration and frequency of the observation? So, is any question so far as I move on to interviews and the other dimensions? Now, so interviews is one of the qualitative data collection methods. And it also employs an instrument, which is a questionnaire. Interviews are used to gather information on the sub in the subject's own words from which insights on their interpretations can be obtained.
Now, there are different types of interviews. On the quantitative end of the study, you have got structured interviews. And on the qualitative end of the study, you have got unstructured interviews. But most of us take the middle road where we use semi-structured interviews. That one, the questions and order of presentation are determined, but the questions are open-ended. So the interviewer recalls the essence of each response. So as he's asking the question, then he, 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 he would end up re recording what is relevant for him to, in relation to that question. But the questions and the other presentation are determined. When you go towards the unstructured, there is flexibility of randomizing the questions. And there's also flexibility of bringing in new questions. And there's also the flexibility of not being very prescriptive in the way the question is worded. So it's very, very, like you said, you are very open, flexible, no structured format and impromptu questions. But when you, but when you go to others, qualitative, quantitative, you are now coming to a structured interview in which the questionnaire is an order is predetermined, but the responses are coded. So you ask asking now, which town do you come from? Instead of the person giving you a breakdown and say that where I come from, maybe la, and add other information to it. You are not interested in that. You are interested about coding. So you say that la is, is what, what code in your category. So la is an urban or a peri-urban community. Then you just write peri-urban, even if that's what you want to do. So you record the information to suit what you are trying to do. So with the totally structured, the questions, order, and coding are predetermined. The respondent is presented with alternatives for each question. So you choose from that. So qualitative said our uh, interviews are focused on open-ended questions, flexible and purposive in nature. While quantitative has first choice questions and usually based on random samples. When you look at the interviews, your approach to them is that you are more open to hear and listen. So you listen more, you talk less, and you are, in, you are patient. You follow up on what participants say and ask questions when you, do, you don't understand. You shouldn't be judgmental about the participants' beliefs or views. Most of the time, we are tell, we encourage people that when you are doing interviews, stay away from judgmental statements and try to keep focus and ask for concrete details. Avoid leading questions like if you did this and do this, that means does it mean this? So you are actually leading a person on. Okay. Do not debate with the participants over the responses because you are a coder and not a debater. Now with a focus group discussion, the objective here is to try to put the people in the group and then engage them so they can learn from their views as a group. And usually it's a semi-structured group session moderated by a leader with the purpose of collecting information on a selected topic. Now, every good focus group should be well planned. Where are you going to do the focus group? Why are you doing it? Who are the members involved? If there are members of uh, this, um, of so, um, um, different sex like male and female, 
you may want to group the group the male in one group and interview them and, and then female in one group and interview them okay so focus groups are very relevant when in the environment you need insights about something and there's no need for exploratory studies and an exploratory says i need a sorry and then when there's understanding between groups and the purpose is to uncover factors that relate to complex behaviors. When there's a need for you to look for information that will help you to be able to go for a larger study, and it happens. But when you are doing it, it's not useful for a charge up environment, environment that people are not united. And where quite a number of statistical projections are needed because you are sitting down and just chatting, it may not be good to be passing things which are very numbered around. And when other methodologies cannot produce a better public uh, information, focus groups then become very relevant. So the duration could be between one to two hours. And then the groupings could be three to six groups. Now we like to group people with the same or similar ideals together. With the focus group, we start with that introduction and a round robin question that tries to put everybody at ease and to relate to their work. Then you move on to the transition. So you move the conversation into key So you you have three the number of key questions you will ask at a transition stage. One, are you studying the experience or the behavior of the person? Or number two, are you trying to find knowledge which you can use in making future decisions? Now, despite these two, you should also know that the respondents have got their own opinions and their own values and their own feeling concerning an issue, and then they will end up responding differently. So you have a transition and you also have the key questions. The key questions you are going to ask about opinions and values, but usually these ones are your follow-up questions based on what you'd have done in the transition. Then you go to the ending. Now, this is not an easy thing to do if you are have a large group and you are, in, you are only one person. So sometimes it's good that you have an assistant among the team to be able to help you do the question because you'll be, you'll be questioning and you may not be able to record effectively whilst you are at the same time doing the questioning. No, I don't know whether anybody here has engaged in a focus group discussion before in his experiences. Has anybody done that? Has anybody done that? Hello, Prof. Yes, please. Something quite similar. Um, Thank you, boys. Yes, please. So um, we were trying to draw a, a strategic plan. And so it's not for a research rather, but um, the management team of the organization gathered together and had a continuous engagement just to pick up data on their experiences and how the previous uh, previous uh, strategic plan fared and what it felt had changed over the period. So I think that's the closest thing I've done to what you are describing. Okay, so in that scenario, how were you able to avoid blame? Because now you have all of you sitting there. How do you avoid people um, trying to apportion blame to others so that it may become a constructive discussion? I think the lead, um, the, the lead consultant brought that up, but he said that he hasn't observed that within that particular group because it seemed like all of them understood the constraints they had on them. So financial constraints, the number of resources and the extent of work they had to do because it's a non-profit organization. 
And so there was quite little incident of the model. Things do come up. There are disagreements here and there once in a while. So it looks like because there was some quite some level of mutual understanding of what they were supposed to be doing and the constraint they had as a team, there was little incidence of blame game. I, I can't remember any particular incidents where somebody is apportioning like failure to another person. Okay, thank you very much. That's very good and relevant information. So what you're saying is true. Sometimes the person who is actually leading the um, or moderating the session is the one who has more control. Like can, you can also sometimes have um, wannabe teachers and, <laughs> and, and, and moderators among them, somebody who tries to take over the conversation and talk a lot. So you have to try to uh, redistribute power so that others can have confi confidence to talk. So whilst the person keeps on raising their hand for the second and third and fourth question, you don't have to say, oh, thank you for your views, but can we hear from somebody else? Then you point out to them, so that some of these things, you have to try to be politically smart about how you, um, you welcome a person's comment, but you also uh, um, just entertain the fact that, and appreciate the fact that the person is willing to comment and then still give opportunity for others who are less shy, quite shy or less confident to be able to also open up. Hello, Prof, please, a question. One observation I made was that sometimes if there is um, a question that he needs to hear from everybody, uh, the lead stopped and he says, give sheets of paper to everybody to write their response to back of how they feel about that particular thing. At a point I thought, well, people may be more able to freely express themselves when they are speaking orally, but sometimes it just made everyone write and then one person reads out what has been written and then everyone discusses it. I don't know what the merits of that one too are, whether it's helpful or other. Oh, okay. It's actually, what you're, what you're actually saying is true because uh, technically you have an um, opportunity to be able to uh, um, get people's view, but you also want to make sure that there's an, an uh, there's an anonymity with some of the views because of the fact that you are in an open space and you don't want to end up creating the, the issue about um, focus groups. You have to create an environment that emotions don't take over the discussion. Otherwise, objectivity will go out of the room. So you want to always be very careful of how you let people who are sharing their views are not, and they'll end up becoming victimized by them. That's why a sheet of paper may be very good. Sometimes even, um, I remember in some of the things that we, we did in the past, we allowed um, us to have, a, everybody has a kind of a, 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 a white paper or whiteboard and you write, the, you think you, you go and write your views on the issues on issues on the board, then you turn, you go to another board and write something else. So by the time you realize you have all contributed to everybody's board. So you can't say that, uh, why is this particular group or particular uh, set of people in the in the focus group saying that uh, they don't like the MD. So everybody's making a statement. So you write here, you go here, you write, you go here, you write, you go here, you write. And by the time you finish, we have, a, we have got a lot of, uh, uh, quite spaces of views about an issue that is going on in the organization, but it's not coming from uh, maybe the subgroups you have divided. Sometimes we do that. You know, it's not coming from group A or group B, but it's a mixture of our views. So all of this is that there is, is you being, uh, you the moderator being emotionally intelligent about what you are doing so that you can be able to arrive at the aim of the meeting. Sometimes even if we don't allow people who have got too much differences in terms of power to even be in the same focus group. For example, you, you mix secretaries with their bosses and MDs all in one focus group, focus group. Now, if it is about team building, that's different. But if it's about addressing something like what you said, uh, um, uh, performance of the company last year, strategic issues may be dis discussed with executives, whilst um, operational issues may be discussed with secretaries or line managers. So you have to then try and draw a, diff a, a, a difference in how you 
do the the uh, the, the the kind of uh, mesha together or to, uh, uh, co co creation of value. How do you put them together to co create value for you? If you don't take care, you put people of different levels of power. The co creation will, would actually fall apart. But you, as a researcher, you are not trying to do all of these things. What your objective is trying to learn of what is going on. But sometimes what you have what happens with that is, is you feel even if some of the issues are sensitive, something like about job, and you mix male and female, you, you may you may not be able to appreciate what the females want to say. So it would be good to have a female uh, working group, uh, focus group discussion and a male focus group discussion. And you'll be able to understand how different views come out together and how they share their, their perceptions about issues. Issues that men don't take for they just take for granted, but could be very big issue among women. And then issues that women take for granted could be very, very big issues among men. But having the individual focus group, uh, the, the gender-based focus group discussion helps you to be able to appreciate the gender differences in the issue. If your focus is looking at um, maybe generational differences, then it will also be very good to put the different generations in different groups. So what I'm just trying to understand is that sometimes I appreciate the unit of analysis for your, of your work. If your work is trying to look at rural versus urban, then it's better you talk to the rural groups than separate it from the urban group. If your work is just looking at um, uh, policy acceptance or policy implementation from the eyes of uh, 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 public sector workers, then you also have to appreciate that in the public sector, uh, uh, among the public sector workers, maybe those who are coming from this ministry are quite different. Those who are coming from this ministry, so you may want to group them in the uh, in, in their in their different uh, ministerial designations. However, if your objective is to try to create a uniform view for something for civil service or for the public sector, then they're mixing they're mixing them together. There's no problem about it. Most of the time, you should be knowledgeable of what you want to do. And as much as possible, try to try to limit the opportunity for um, anything that would would create the environment to turn the environment to an emotionally charged environment. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah, Benis. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Yes, please. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Your voice is, is very low, or is my voice is low? Oh, please, is it better? Yes, it's better now. Okay. And so, I want to get a clearer picture of what focus group discussion, um, the focus group is. Is it about um, getting the participants of your study together at a place and engaging them in a discussion? I mean, using the interview guide, is it like that? Or... Um, I don't know, like I said, I want to get a clearer picture of how the whole thing looks like when you say you are doing a focus group, um, using a focus group to collect your data. And please, I also wanted to find out, um, during discussions, like you are saying, sometimes depending on the uh, discussion or topic is, you might decide to group uh, maybe um, top management uh, differently as well from, um, let's say, um, the operational work. Uh -huh. so my question is, what if maybe with the operational uh, people, you're also asking questions that bother on maybe the MD, and sometimes you don't know, you might have someone who is on good terms with the MD, and through the discussions, someone will also try to give an information that might not be too nice about the MD. What if after the uh, discussion, the other person goes to give this information to the MD? So how, how I mean, I want to find out, how do you go about some of these things? Thank you. Okay, so the first question that you said, you were wanted to know what a focus, focus group is a type of interview where multiple participants are involved and the responses build on one another. So you're not trying to learn one person's response. You are trying to make sure that you get the thing from a, from a group perspective. 
Now, it is very good for you to be able to do an entry into a community if you want to get an understanding of whatever, how certain things work. So sometimes, instead of you trying to ask for an individual, you want to get a group perspective so they can have multiple views coming at the same time. And then you can also have differences in the multiple groups because they could, they could share different, different experiences and you can get them together. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yes, please. So in the picture here, you see that there are people seated together at the round table and a person may be engaging them. So um, like engaging students on their views concerning um, doing a PhD in University of Ghana. So you could actually put female together and ask them if that's your focus and, and, and put together male and ask them, or you can do it by year group. So you take year four, year two, year three, and year one students. And then you actually interact with them and try to learn from them. Now, when you finish report, you're not going to report that, report that uh, Kwame Na in year two said that this, you're going to say that the year two students tend to have this view. Do you understand? Okay. Good. That's what you're going to end up saying. So the, the group that you have will share. Okay, and then because you have got different views that are coming up to form the view of the group, you'll be able to understand and appreciate where differences could occur. So in the past, sometimes somebody may be going to do a study in let's say uh, Abuwishi market. Instead of going one into one on one interview with everybody, he may like to talk to all the market leaders in the or the different um, 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 grains leaders. So the one for maize, the one for cassava, the one for tomatoes, the one for um, 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 maybe onions, and all those market leaders. He sits down with them and have interaction on how do they use momo to be able to sell their stuff at the market. And what and how do their, how are their taxes that you collect from them being used to improve the activities in the market? So when you end up getting the view, now you are getting the view from the onion, onion leader as a leading rep and is having experience of the onion, onion trade. Then the tomato trade is also trader is still giving view on tomato trade perspective. And the person coming from cabbage or any other one is also giving you for based on their experience. So there, there in the room, you could actually say that there tends to be a, uniform, a, a consensus concerning how Momo is helping all these uh, commodity, um, all these uh, uh, um, greens and vegetable uh, 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 commodities sellers, uh, and they, or, or retailers or wholesalers, whichever you want to call them. Then you end up trying to say, but those from tomato tend to have a peculiar situation because their product is rapidly perishable. You see how the argument is going. I'm taking the different views to be able to create a story. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Mm? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Good. Now I'm hoping that maybe because of what you have asked, I'm hoping to bring data on uh, uh, focus group discussion for you to be able to see. Let me see if I can find one. Maybe today, mom, I wanted today actually, I wanted to do this kind of tutorial because every year I just teach it and go. But I want to go ask somebody to go and do it, he doesn't even know how to do it. Because I want to teach you then give you about one week for all of you to collect some data and come so that we can analyze it together. I want you to engage you guys to understand the methods so that you can go and collect some data based on any question that you have. Okay. So it's good. You can even do focus groups in your class. In the past, when we used to do face-to-face, -face, we divide ourselves into two. Then we take turns in moderating each group. Then I'll stand there and tell you the mistakes that you have done. Yeah, maybe we can do that in the next session where we do uh, um, if tonight. I don't know whether tonight we'll meet, but we can break ourselves into um, breakout rooms. And then I'll give you a question. One person will start asking, and I'll come and look, observe and advise. OK, so let's continue. Um, I, sorry, I, I, I said I was going to show you an example that if I can find. So just give me a second on focus group, since that's the question where I see a hand. Is that the same? Clement, let your question go. Whilst I find an example to show the class. So what is interesting is that some of you here don't even know, understand what we are talking about. It is because Benny's question came that you're understanding. Please, I am not the best researcher in the world or the whole world, but I'm relatively good. If you don't ask me questions, you won't learn anything. That's what I'm begging you. Because it seems you come to class, most of you just want to just check the box that uh, you're back class, you yeah, just finish and go. But if you do that, I'll just last week like this. I was very, very sad when I finished the class. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes I don't want to even do um, double sessions with you. Because if I'm not engaged, I don't, I'm not into, 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 I'll just give you the basic. And when the time is up, you still struggle. 
So engage the lecturer, engage the lecturer, ask relevant questions that you yourself, you realize that, okay, this one, if I was doing my work, I don't really know how to do this. So the lecturer, where is possible? The lecturer will answer. But if you're just learning to get your marks, anyway, exams is coming. I know how to set my exam questions. It will be more practice-based so that everybody will end up going, coming back to ask a question. <laughs> Oh, please, I'm um, talking about exams. Oh, please, please, um, hold on. Clement is, um, I'm sorry about you, please. Clement's hand is, uh, I said Clement should come. Sorry. Good yes, afternoon, sir. Prof. I, 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 you don't have any right to ask good afternoon, me. Prof. Because uh, I, if I didn't mention it, prof, can you, hear me? you have it as part of your um, um, post-study questions, like after we close. So if that's the case, then I'll answer it at the end of the class. I just respectfully so that we can do some more interesting things now. Okay, so you can ask it at the end of the class, Adria. Prof, good oh, afternoon, uh, Prof. Uh, Clement, go ahead. Yeah, Prof, good afternoon. Oh, please go uh, ahead. Prof, I want to ask a question. Yes, please. Um, supposing you have uh, the focus group, but supposing you have the number up to six of them, and uh, if you have six focus groups and the number of the participants ranges up to 12, 12 of them in a group, if you pose a question, how will the moderator or the researcher be able to control the discussions? Because looking at the number of the groups and the, the, the number of participants in each group, well, are you going to move group to the other or you are going to uh, give the question to them at a time so that you'll be able to uh, listen and get the answers from them? I think that the, it, will, it will be too much for the researcher or the researcher will have to get somebody to assist him. Okay. So what you have, no yeah, what you are talking about, I don't think I understand how focus group is done. So focus group is done in a way that at the end of the day, uh, you have one group at a time that you are interviewing. You don't, you don't move around and say that you are going to talk to them or all of them at the same time. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I get you, Prof. Okay, good. I get you. Good. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Okay. So you don't move around to say that you are trying to do that at the, uh, uh, in, in that in that in that sense. You actually have to discuss with them. Um, each group ha have a meeting with each group and then ask your questions. And after you go to another group and ask your questions. Is that better, Prof? I'm okay. Thank you, Prof. Very good. Okay. So um, if you are ready, I'm, I'll show you what I was wanting to show you. But I think there was a hand up. I just still has a hand up. Or oh, your hand has gone down. Please, I put it down, sir. Uh, you said I should ask at the end. Yes, please. Okay. So I'm um, hold on. I'm coming. I was looking for. I was thinking if I can find my methodology, but I don't think I have the I have the findings here. The findings will give an idea, but I was looking for the methodology. The methodology for um, putting the focus group together. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, because of time, because of time, let me um, just show you the whole report. Maybe later, but well, I didn't even plan for this, so I didn't come with the uh, I say I didn't come with the, the methodologies. Okay, I think I found something. Okay, good. I found something. I found I found something. Okay, this is a policy brief that we worked on. The methodology is there, but it doesn't have the quotes. So I'll show you two things. Let me just show you a methodology 
on the ICT part. The study is bigger than ICT. The study is about gender differences in um, in in uh, setting up, starting and running a, a micro enterprise. And then, we, and then I was brought on board to look at how technology supports the micro entrepreneurs in setting in the in this setting up their business. So I will show you my part. And after that, I'll show you the focus group of the whole team. So now let's look at my, my part here. The study explores the differences in ICT adoption by owners of micro enterprises in Ghana. It offers preliminary insights into ICT differences. So this was before we went do the major quantitative study. We wanted to understand whether and what questions should we be asking when we go to the field? And what are the people, what do what, what the people's experience in terms of ICT ownership, ICT usage and benefits, ICT shared access, expenditure and challenges? So these are preliminary anal analysis. This preliminary insights will in provide contextual information. So that's one good thing about a, a focus group discussion. It helps you to get some contextual information to inform a quantitative study after. Doesn't mean that the whole research cannot be based on focus group, it can be based. Now, the study adopts a qualitative approach to explore preliminary insight to gender differences in ICT adoption in Ghana. 16 focus group discussions were conducted in four urban contexts. So you see what is happening here. So I did 16 in four urban contexts, then I mentioned that in four rural contexts. So some of you have been hearing me mention a lot because I was there myself, teaching man and Bolgatanga. Okay, Bolgatanga too, I also went there. Okay, as such, the study covers eight of the 10 regions. Now, so what happens is that in some of the regions we do we do rural, in another region we do urban, another region we do rural, or then they do urban. When we're going to do qualitative, when we're going to do the quantitative study, we also have to mix it like that. Because we are trying to look at the differences in rural and urban. So as such, the study covers eight of the 10 regions in Ghana. That's the, the, those that, that those times, that is far 2014, 2015. Separate focus group discussion were conducted for each gender. At, at all the data collection sites. Uh, each focus group consisted of an average of 10 respondents. So remember I told you that it's, it's about six to eight. Sometimes I think, I would add this, my slides, part of my slides also says that it could be um, um, four to 12, and the ideal site is 68, okay. Okay, respondent, respondents were either own account managers or micro entrepreneurs engage in diverse diversity of business activities covering restaurants, manufacturing, retail, agro processing, and food processing. Each that's the first I think I met the woman who who does the blessed child products. Because I think I met her in the Accra focus group discussion. At that time she was starting the business and she was doing she was now starting I think starting from the home or something like that. Each uh, focus group discussion was conducted by two moderators. So the gentleman was asking me, how do you manage it in case a group is big? So this is a group of 10, there are two moderators. Where one moderator asked the questions and another moderator recorded answers by tip and text. Text means like a note taking. Interpreters were then used where necessary. So interpreters were standing there. I remember in Nagosome, they were standing behind us. So where I wanted to ask a question, I didn't know how to say it in a way. And the person, if I'm right, I think they speak a way. Those who are there. Am I right? Or oh, it's not ever? It's ever. It's ever. Okay, ever. Okay, they speak ever. Thank you very much for correcting me. I was saying ever, they say ever. Okay. A, a total of one six respondents were interviewed. So you see, there's somebody who think that focus group cannot do a large number, but look at this one six respondents, one, 176 respondents were interviewed in a focus group discussion across the country. The recorded tests were transcribed and the transcriptions were triangulated with note taking during the focus group discussion to develop a richer picture. Then data was analyzed using, oh, but you see, mouse and human man have been using it for a long time. Mouse and human man, <laughs> <laughs> as of that time, as <laughs> least. Okay, so um, now if you look at what you see, uh, this is just the raw, this is a, a policy brief, so I couldn't bring quotes into it. So if I will beg of you, I'm going to switch to the, the main study in which to see other questions so they can see the data itself. Is that okay? I think I have this data somewhere. So I'll find the data for us to use for qualitative analysis. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and find the data because I think we use MVivo or something like that to help analyze. So let's look at the, um, um, the data itself. Okay, so we were in the data itself, we we're trying to understand this was the title. You see, ICT I was in number three. So I think I may have, let me check. 
Let me see. I should see. Do I have quotes? Yes, I have quotes here. I have quotes here. Good. The ICT section. Okay. Good, good. I have quotes here. I have good quotes here. Okay, but I think let me benefit. I don't want to do everything technology. Just look at the other lecture. Other students are here. So this was the work. It was done by Abuna Odo, Richard Wati, and Charles Akra. These are now all professors in the university. So gender and enterprise development Africa, the case of Ghana. We had some IDRC funding for 700,000, I think, dollars, Canadian dollars, if I'm right. Now, this, if you are saying dollars, you have to say it well so that people don't collapse. <laughs> so, okay, so we are using two theories in, in from the theories coming. There's something we call theory based analysis. So, look at what you are using the theory to guide us in our work. So, there are two main theories necessity and opportunity. Theories have been have tried to explain the main reasons why individuals will opt for self employment. So, why did you start your own business? That's the question we're asking. Necessity theory. Hey, please, if you want to go and do your PhD and you know, these ideas are given, it, this, is, it's, this one is my our work. Don't steal it for your PhD anyway. <laughs> Necessity theory proceeds that individuals choose to be self employed because of unavailability of work, whilst opportunity theory suggests that people enter into self employment because of identified opportunity. So that is said. So now we understand the theory. So let's continue. The main purpose of this section is to therefore identify differences in the factors that motivate self-employment between men and women. Do you understand it? This was done through a series of focus group discussion across the length and breadth. Hey, this is Ghana English, length and breadth of the country, across the country. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so this is self-determinants of determinants of selection into self-employment among women. Several factors were identified as the main reasons why women will enter into self-employment. Several participants identified, you see, do you, do you see what you are saying? Several participants. So not like we count them and say out of the 178, 30 of them said this. It says several participants identified family influence and ties as the main reason why they entered into self-employment. According to... Thank you. According to a female respondent, my dad is a poultry farmer. And as, as a child, I had to work with him until I grew up and decided to set up my own enterprise. Even though I was in school, anytime school vacated, I had to join my father at the farm. I grew up with the desire of becoming of a, of becoming a successful self successful a, a successful self-employed, a, a successful and successful and self-employed. I think it's just direct translation from the from the uh, interview transcript. Well, we copied it as is. As is. Well, this is the, the first level write-up. It's not the final one, so please forgive me. Just like my father, his poetry was one of the best at, the, at, the, at, that, at, the, at the time. Focus group discussions, Accra. Do you realize what's happening? So there are three quotes here, where the discussion took place and then the female respondent. The method, the location, and then the who is the respondent. Additional acquisition, additionally, acquisition of special skills could also serve as a motivational factor to encourage some women to engage in self-employment. In other words, some women engage in self-employment years after be, gaining adequate skills needed to op operate and their own business, especially if they had problems with their employ employers. An experience of a participant of a of of the of of the fair it's supposed to be of the of the focus group discussion provides an anecdotal illustration. Now we are not claiming statistical. That's why it's going to provide anecdotal information. So some uh, uh, um, some information some kind of direction in that area. That's what it's trying to say. So it goes on to say, look at this. Uh, previously, I used to work with some someone until I sought permission to attend a funeral. Unfortunately, I was replaced as soon as I left. And I was upon my return, I decided to be on my own. I was especially encouraged to do this because I had at that time acquired the skills yet to operate independently. Forgot this group discussion Accra. Then this person said some things earlier, which was not relevant to us, but what is relevant is that, is that I entered into yogurt the yogurt business after acquiring special skills for yogurt production through a training organized by the Ministry of Agriculture for, for Women. So skill development is important. But that self skill, there are two levels of analysis here. That self, that skill development can either be gained by a government intervention or your own self learning, like you yourself going to learn. So this person said, I acquired the skills independent, 
him, himself. And this one, he went through a training program by uh, Ministry. So if you want to extend the uh, uh, argument, you can say that acquisition of special skills could either be on by through self self development or through um, self development where you yourself um, or through your own initiative or through um, a, 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 a third party or through a support from um, a support from government. This means that individuals may enter into self employment because of experience gained from either from uh, from his family. Remember, the first one was family while growing up. Okay. And then um, in this case, in the case ju just discussed, the woman became self-employed not because of an identified opportunity or needed to work with, to, to, not because of an identified opportunity or needed to work to maintain a livelihood. She just wanted to be successful, uh, wanted to be a successful self-employed, such as, just like the father. Now it means that this is challenging the theory. The two theories don't have space for this. This is how you challenge theory from your data. The two theories don't have space for it. The first theory is about uh, identified an opportunity. The second theory is about the need to work. So sometimes somebody can come from intrinsic desires about unconcerning success. The person has a personal desire to be successful in life. It's not because of an opportunity or, or need to work. And that desire is what drove him to become to do to become self-employed. So that one is not captured in any of these two. So maybe it may be captured by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He, no, even that one will be more about needed one. But this one is about, is about um, self, um, is a person's identity as a person, what he wants to make for himself. And there may be a theory for that I, because I'm not a, a behavioral scientist or a social scientist, I've not looked into it, but I know there'll be a theory to help explain this part. But the first two choices that we choose doesn't explain it. And sometimes it can happen to you too, that the choice you choose cannot explain everything you see in the field. So you need to bring other theories. That's why people do post-study framework and revise what they said earlier. Other, oh, part hey. other participants explained family influence and ties in different ways. Okay. My mom was working as a volunteer for World Vision at Dangbe West and realized that workers were always researching for food to no avail. However, anytime some of them came to our house and we offered food, they liked it. My mom then decided to cook for the employees of World Vision and ended up setting up a restaurant. This opportunity. I, de I therefore had no option than to work for her. Her mom's own is opportunity, but her own is not opportunity. Uh, I therefore had no option than to work for her until I finally ended up as a restaurant operator. I think I remember this person because it's in Accra. Yeah. Because the, the lady didn't come, this, this particular interview, the lady didn't come, the mother didn't come. She was she came herself. And so when we are asking questions concerning is this one problem that if you don't have the real person, the owner manager to be there and somebody who inherited it comes. When we ask questions about how the business started and ask about some of the issues that happened when they started itself, she couldn't answer because it was her mom who experienced it, not her. I remember this particular one. The main business of my family is palm kernel oil making. We were born into this business. Okay, interesting. Everyone in the family gets to know this business unconsciously while growing up. And once you grow up, it becomes part of you. Like I was on a blacksmith is like that for the men. Okay, so this one, is about family ties, influence and ties by then acquisition of skills. Then you have another set of uh, interviews that come show passion for particular occupation. Now all the things you see as building up here are what we call the, the, the teams, the themes that are coming up. So somebody can talk plenty, but it may just be, it may, it may just speak to only one theme. All the things the person saying may just speak to only one theme. Okay, now let me ask, answer. I know a lot of people may have questions concerning what I've just read. So let me take your questions here before we go ahead with the other methods. But has it been helpful? Those of you who wanted to understand uh, Foucault's group, has it been helpful? Very, very helpful, Fro. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, Adria, you had a question. It's not related to focus group. Um, I actually have one question. So 
I wanted to ask, um, whilst you were reading, um, it occurred to me that to what extent can we modify uh, what people say and still keep it as theirs? Uh, because the, what, what happens when the, the language, um, you, you understand the meaning, but it is not in line with the, the right language or, um, for example, if somebody, uh, this is only for speech, but then in, in, in cases where somebody has written something and what they've written is probably in, I don't know, American English and yours is in uh, uh, UK um, per the requirements of your, your, your work. Um, to what extent can you make changes? Because I do see some 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 um, subject verb disagreements and okay. so on in this. Okay, so um, if it has to do with um, people's view, let's say um, respondents' views or, or quotes from the field, do you understand me? Hello? Hello? Hello, Prof, we can hear you. Yeah, if it has to do yeah, with we can hear you. The, the respondent's view, what is advisable is that this one, this is just direct translation that um, it was done by the focus. It, it, we, we interviewed the people in Chi and, and Ga, and then somebody transcribed it for us. Now, the, that means that the transcription is the one that has the problem. Now, you have to be very careful that what you are changing, it has to do with the what you're changing has to do with the grammatical issues which, which enhance readability, not change the essence of the argument. That is one. Number two, what you're changing doesn't also affect the, um, in, in humanetics, but if I would tell you that you, you have to look at the semiotics. Uh, around the language, how the person pauses in the statements that he's sharing with you. So sometimes a person is saying something like, I'm just, I'm just let me give you an example. It happens to us, not because of Zoom, but you hear, hear this. So the person say, as a child, I wanted to be a fashion designer. And no, I wanted to be a seamstress. Okay, then hmm, this fashion. Now that part, he's mentioned fashion designer, they said, hmm, seamstress. Okay, has a different meaning to the whole discussion there, if you want to analyze it. So if you lose that part and just say that the person, as a child, look at what your person, as a child, I want to be a fashion designer, this passion was, had been part of me. If that thing happened and you didn't capture that part, you have only presented another view that the person was very certain about being a fashion designer. But if I captured what I told you right now, if I was the respondent, and what I actually said was, mm, fashion designer, but okay, seamstress. In Ghana, fashion designer is different from seamstress in terms of their understanding. So if you don't take care, the person was emphasizing about trying to be somebody who just, I don't know if I should use the Ghanaian parlance, or yeah, 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 just sewing things to repair people's uh, uh, clothes. So you have got this tone, this thing, you do it for you. And you equated the fashion designer, you have misinterpreted the data. Kogu, I hope you understand me. You know, there's a difference between a fashion designer and Oya oh, yeah, Those of you who, who, who have been in, in, in Accra and I met those who have got a, a, sim, a, a sewing machine, single sewing machine on their head and the scissors in their, in their hand. Who, has, who knows that scene? Who can help me? Mm -hmm. Or all of you here, you are you don't. You have I know seen. it. I know it. I even know the song. Okay, good. I can sing it to you, but I don't have a good voice. Okay, thank you very much. Please, it seems you are the only person who is Ghanaian here. The rest of the students, you come from Iraq. So, oh, well, we are here. Oh, well. <laughs> I was yeah. actually, I didn't know, we know them. We know, oh, we know, we know, we know them, we've worked we know with them, them. before. <laughs> and we, we've used their services. Oh, I so, what I'm trying to say is that if you interpreted that person to fashion designer, you have messed up the data. So, in the, in the in trying to translate, you always have to be very careful that the essence of the of the of the information and the context of the information is not stripped away. 
Remember, we learned that in qualitative research, context should not be taken away from, from, from the data. Otherwise, when you strip context away from data, interpretation is different. That's why that, and, and Professor Fatu will tell you that, that there's semiotics, and why uh, uh, that you have to be actually careful about the interpretation of even exclamation marks and everything and pauses within the statement. Because all of it has got different meaning. Okay. But if you look at, look at this right up here, the way it is presented is as if the person talks nonstop without even pausing and breathing and drinking water. So all those parts are not captured. And it's because of the way we're doing the study. We're just doing for good. We're going to collect the data and just go, go ahead. But where a person is in more is more concerned about doing uh, uh, something different and wants to actually uh, present information that will let us understand context. It becomes different. It becomes important for, uh, uh, for the person to be able to look at it. So there's a oh, good. I wanted to get, okay, good. Please, is there any question related to that? So before I round up on this one. Is there any other question? Okay, so it's actually- There's a question on sorry, issues I, I of mean, bias I mean, when you don't understand I mean, the language. Okay, then let me, let me, let me explain the two times. I mentioned the right way. So it says semiotics and then semantics. So semiotics has to do with the, the systematic study of the sign process and then and meaning and, and sign processes and meaning making. So semiotics, semiosis is an activity or conduct or process that involves science and where a sign is defined as anything that communicates something. So usually a meaning, call, um, usually called a meaning to sign the interpreter. So when a person is talking and the kind of signs that he's making could be one, then the semantics has to do with the language itself. So I was mixing the two. So there's semiotics and then semantics. Okay, so semantics and semantics. So the sem semantics has to do with a bunch of linguistics and logic concerning with meaning. So it's the two of them that come together in terms of what you are talking about. So you have to be careful of, about the semiotics and the semantics of the communication that's being relayed to you. The signs are behind it and the language and the logic between the, uh, that is used to be the medium of communication to you. Usually we don't take these things in, into consideration, but it's important. It's important. Okay. Good. So um, 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 you said there was a question about something else. I beg you, I just, since you are the only Ghanaian here, please help me. What, did, what was it? Sorry, I was saying that, so Norbert was asking how you handle issues of bias, especially um, uh, in the case when you don't understand the language and you have to depend on an interpreter. I, I, how do you even know that bias has taken place? I was about to ask that because how would you know they could be talking about you and you're nodding your head saying yes I agree. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, reminded me of somebody. <laughs> okay, so um, what our advice? What our advice is that um, we in in qualitative research you don't only use one interpreter. So what you do is that you get another person who can support the work to actually corroborate. So what then we do, for example, even let me just, Uber taught you, um, you students, um, uh, research uh, literature review. Now, ideally when you are doing a literature review like what you are doing, it should be done by at least two authors. But what the search is also a very subjective process. What you may call relevant, I will not call it relevant. Do you understand me? Somebody may search about school, like school, um, education in higher, edu higher education. Now, as he searches, something may come up about higher education in Africa, higher education in like Namibia, higher education in South Africa. Supposing a person grew up in Kenya, it will surprise you that he will just be drawn to things from the East Africa without unconsciously knowing that 
you know, he can relate to that data very easily. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So she, if you don't have a, a second author to also go through it, you will not be able to check the biases. So very good literature review. The person was even say that after I've done this search and this, I also compared it together my other the second or the second author who also performed another search using these parameters. And after that, we sat down and we were able to um, um, uh, um, agree on the uh, the common uh, the, the select select a common uh, 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 nomenclature or categorization of the literature so that we will know which of them we are accepting, which of them we are eliminating. That is what we do. So you always have to create opportunity for reliability. How do you establish reliability? So in qualitative research, when we talk about data collection, reliability is ensured by having a case study protocol and having a case study database. So that's one of the approaches of doing that. There's a lot of approaches on doing contract validity, um, 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 uh, reliability, and then, um, then there, are other, there are other dimensions too. External validity to good. So I will, I will discuss about those things later after we have learned about how to collect data. Now, one thing that you need to do is to be able to have your, K, your, your case book where you put in the time you went there, who you interviewed, all the issues that happened in the in concern the interview. And even if there were certain specific occurrences that happened, you capture it. Because all of these things are things that gives context to how the data was collected. So that when somebody's interpreting it, it can be interpreted with that particular knowledge. However, with language translation, you may have to get another person to just read through. For example, we did a project in which I had to manage um, respondents, um, uh, researchers across uh, West Africa. So we took people from Togo, Benin, Syria, uh, no, um, Senegal. Now, all those three countries, I went to the language center to translate the questionnaire into English and to French and then gave it to them. Then when they collected their data in French, they gave it to me in French. I went back to the language center to give it to them to translate it back into English then took it back to them to read whether those of them could actually appreciate some English to see whether we are done in translation well. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. When I tell I finished, the data that was relevant for the work was only one from Senegal. Where the one from Senegal, the guy was a professor. So he did the translation himself and gave it to me. The UK, the, the language center that I came to, it's not the University of Ghana language, it's another language center services. It was a private one. The language center that I did do translation for people in uh, conferences and stuff. The language center I went to see here, because they didn't understand what I was doing with e-government, they were translating some of the French statements about, and French can be very, very tricky. You may see a word like le, le escalier, which is about stairs. If you don't take it, you write escalator. So if you're not very careful, you are writing something which is closer to it too, but you are, you are a little bit off. And sometimes to the, depending on the, uh, on the person who is talking, you may use some French words out of respect than as compared to others. So if you don't translate it in context, you will not be able to understand what you have. So the only one that I could use entirely was the one from the uh, uh, Senegal because the lecturer who did the project, who got the contract there was, uh, was uh, uh, an English speaker himself. So he translated his own for us. But the one I went to do with third party, <clears throat> I had to be skimming through the data to see what uh, any relevant statement in English that I can use for my analysis. So that's the truth I'm telling you, not but from the field. <laughs> so if, if, if you have some money- get to Next time, please call us. We'll sort you out. Oh, I didn't know that you're you are bilingual or multilingual. Okay. Multi. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can speak, um, uh, what's the name? Fafra. Hey, no, Prof, I take it easy, oh. Okay, no, we are doing a study in, in the Northern region. So if you cannot help me with that one. <laughs> okay, so please, let's just look at these issues whenever we are going to the field. Very, very relevant question, no, but very, very relevant question. Okay, okay, uh, somebody said, oh yeah, there is called fashion support services. Hey, that's just interesting, interesting translation. <laughs> FSS, maybe somebody in marketing should do a study on that. Fashion support services in Ghana, a study of... <laughs> Okay, mom Puli. Okay, Boysen. Okay, Boysen, we'll talk later. <laughs> Please, um, now that you appreciate the data that we have I've shared with you and you understand it, um, if there's no question, Prof, on... Prof, Prof, I will help you in Flavra. I will help you in the Flavra language. Okay, then. 
Thank you very much. I'll contact you. Clement, yes. this was 15 well, seconds yes. ago. Get with the program. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's move on to uh, another uh, method. Now we have understood focus group very well, which I'm very happy. At least now people are, are confident. confident. So what I'll move on to, it will be an uh, observation, which is also very tricky. And then after that, um, see if we can round it up. And then, then later in the day, if we can meet, we can see what we'll do. Okay, so let's continue with, um, good. So uh, like I said, if you realize, I use um, 10. So 10, and, and these people are doing, um, the suggested number is six to eight. But if you do 10, you have to try and have two moderators. So that makes it easier for you to carry it out. Okay, now, so you start with a round robin question and then, and then try to locate everybody. So it was during the location of everybody, I realized that the, the lady whose mother uh, was cooking for World Vision, she came, but not the mother came, she came herself. So I realized that some of the questions that had to do with the startup of the, starting, the startup stage of the organization, she couldn't say much because she was, she was a student or a, a child then. She didn't know, she can't remember some of the details as compared to other people, for example, We've got to understand that when people start their shop, within the first two or three years, you may move your shop about six times. And I didn't even know about that. That's a characteristic that was very common. Somebody's in tabletop, tomorrow he has moved the tabletop to another tabletop. On the same street, though, you can move like six times, depending on which house is giving you a, 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 a opportunity, or maybe there is a road construction, so you have to change. So they kept on changing and changing and changing and changing until they got enough money to move to a market center and got enough customers to direct them to the market center. So that's a, that's a very interesting dynamic that I didn't know, but it was to a full group discussion that when somebody shared it, when well, somebody said, I also went through the same thing, I changed about four or five times. And then and somebody will tell you that even change, change the business. So something is not selling very well. So you end up taking that one to the back end and then in front of the, so your kiosk is like two businesses. So in front of the kiosk, you are selling the thing that goes very fast, that will attract people. When they come and stand there, then you tell them you also have something which is behind. <laughs> very, very interesting uh, way of doing your own snowballing or recommend, recommending your, 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 uh, your customers to other products that you have. So you learn all these things whilst you, you, you interact with them in a focus group. And because they are collaborating it, it makes it easy for you to believe that, oh, this is a possibility. Not that you interview only one person, you said it, and the next person you say the same thing. Okay. Now, observation is very good because you are there in yourself as a participant observer, if that's what you want to do, to, to try to take real um, uh, um, world evidence, of, uh, the, uh, have a, a direct experience of the phenomenon. So like, yes, let's say that Kujoentri is releasing an album and doing the album making, you are in the studio of Kujoentri. You capture the emotions behind even statements and lines. You may hear something like, uh, 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 Afro Fronto, for all you know, the right first writer, the O was not part of it. But as they were going, then the, the organist did something. They said, okay, if I add O, it will be part of it. Then you realize that how music can be very emergent. And sometimes some music is even born out of, for example, they started doing maybe Afro Fronto, uh, but Afro Fronto was not the actual song they were trying to do. They were doing maybe a Hini, a Hini. And as they were doing Hini, then he got another melody and he started singing that one or writing that one they realized that oh Charlie, that one will work faster so they will stop that uh, me and go straight to our front door and finish that one and come back and you see it's a complex interaction of uh, of talent imagination and and different highs and lows which when you are just interviewing the person you will never experience that the person will just tell you but you will not there's a different difference in experiencing it and then watching it the same thing to do with um, um, election night. Those of you have been at election night, be at the police station election night. Not you vote and you go. When they are counting, when you hear it on the news, it's quite different. But when you are there and you see how people have been standing there since 12 midnight and it's the next day, two days have come, they are still in standing there at their post, not moved, just eating at the same place. I don't want to say drinking and sleeping at the same place because as soon as he turns, he's afraid that somebody will change, take a ballot box away. You experience that one; it's a quite a different, a different feeling. I don't know whether anybody can can test it with you. Who has been a police agent here before? All of you are very, very non-political. Uh, Ramadan is here. It's Atadika. <laughs> okay, it's Ms. Uh, Honorable Ramadan here. Maybe you can tell us the truth. Oh, he's not here. Today he's not here. Okay, maybe it's a parliament. Okay, 
So those of you who have done, all of you are hiding. In Jefferson, haven't you been a poli polling agent before? Or you don't want to do No, <laughs> No, <laughs> no problem. Okay, so it's a different I feeling. Don't okay, it's a different feeling. Maybe Abdul Malik. Yeah, your name sounds like somebody who has been doing that. Abdul Malik Adam, Kukubako's brother. Okay, so you may have been there, and the, the experiences is very different. Recently, you had somebody went to drink tea. By the time you came to finish drinking the tea and came back, the results had changed. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't leave. You don't leave and go and drink tea. You drink the tea whilst you're standing there. <laughs> anyway, so. It's advisable that um, you appreciate uh, the role of observation. Don't take it for granted, especially you direct observation or participant observation where you are there yourself. Now, <laughs> now uh, apart from that, there is also what we call the non-participant observation in which you don't go yourself to join the team, but you can actually, you don't participate that in the activity, but you can watch from afar. <laughs> or you can interview people and get their view. Now that one, you're unobtrusive. You're not interfering with the collection, data collection period, you're just observing. Then there's also naturalistic observation that what the coaches do during World Cup, during Olympic, uh, Olympic games and stuff. What they do is that they go and watch the football players or the athletes as they are performing. And they make choices. Oh, I want to buy this player. I want to work with this person. So that's one. The kind of the kind of thing is that you are there in the natural. It's like a participant. You are not participating. You are more of um, observing, but you are in the natural natural environment in which the activity occurs. So I don't. If you have those of you who have man um, worked um, into football, you realize that sometimes um, those who buy players. They go and watch them. Even in Ghana, sometimes some when you're having African Cup of Nations, you have got football agents who come to the African Cup of Nations to come and look for new stars that they would like to represent. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And then they come there and then they try to observe them. In the US, we have that in the, in the NBA. You call the you call them scouts. The scouts come there and sit down and look at even college football games to see whether they can pick them up. In the same way. You as a researcher may want to observe maybe a festival and you are writing about something like that. So you want to see how that uh, festival actually takes place or you are trying to do a study on social agriculture and you think that you want to try and understand how the farmer uses the social media to be able to extend the, the, his market reach. So you actually have to be on the, if the farmer has been has a time that he sits down to upload, take pictures from the cabbage and upload it. You want to experience it. So you go and watch the farmer doing that. In that way, you are actually watching the farmer in the naturalistic, in the environment or setting in which the event is taking place. So they call that naturalistic observation. Now naturalistic observation, you are observing and, 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 rec and recording. You are not interfering as a participant. So it's, a, it's kind of a more of a, a non-participant observer, you are not participating, but you are observing in the naturalistic environment. But you can also do non-participant non observation without being there by talking to somebody who has already been there. So a researcher watches, but does not participate in group activities or a researcher conducts interviews with teachers in the school, but he's not part of the teaching activity or participate in the teaching activity. Then there is covert observation, which the marketers call we use for mystery shopping. If you have been participated in mystery shopping before, you know about it. So you want to know certain, uh, um, have certain information concerning your product. So you can get students or maybe um, salespersons who dress like um, a customer or maybe a difficult customer, a rich customer, a different type of, you give them different personas to, to adapt and go to the shop and try to behave like that. So if you're, if you're trying to test, I remember, I, I, I worked some time ago as a mystery shopper when I was doing my page in UK. And I was supposed to be a, 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 a difficult a customer who was finding difficulty in selecting a particular product. And I was supposed to do it in a shop to be able to test customer service uh, uh, um, 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 training that I had given to the employees of that particular, um, it was a, a sport, no, not a sports, um, a clothing wear company. So when I went in the, so that they give you a script that you're supposed to follow. And then you're supposed to document when you come back, everything that you went through. So they like using qualitative researchers to do that, if you are good. 
But sometimes in Ghana, yeah, people you just use students. Now, what happens is that as soon as you enter, for example, you're supposed to be greeted by check. You're supposed to be greeted by a shop attendant as soon as you enter as part of a customer service. Then within the first three minutes, or uh, within the first, uh, less than the first uh, uh, 40 seconds of being there, somebody should walk up to you and ask you that, can I help you? So if all of these things doesn't okay, or even it okay, you have to put it down on who approached you, who or what time the person approached you, and, and then capture all this information. So when you go there, you, you are not going there with the camera. You have to you have a very good memory so that as the things are occurring, you are you are kind of taking note of them so that you can be able to write your report with that. I'll, I'll try and look for, see if I can find my report. Maybe I'll find it. So in my old emails, there in my, I think I had some Yahoo email some time ago, it's inside. So what you do is that you are trying to become, you are not trying, you're actually a mystery shopper. And your objective is to try to capture such information. Now, you as a researcher, you may also do that, if you to, especially when you realize that if the people realize, identify you as a, a researcher from University of Ghana, they will change their behavior. We call it observer effect. When observer, when ob the observed changes the behavior because of the presence of the observer. Let me define it again. Observer effect is when the observed, the one who is being observed, changes the behavior because of the presence of the observer. He can change the behavior, not because he wants to make you happy, but just because he, he, he feels that he's been observed. So that what he would have done naturally, he doesn't do again. Now, this means that sometimes covert observation becomes very important. Because if you're not very careful, like you're doing a study on Sakawa, if you're not very careful, um, like my, one of my students did one with the criminals himself, because he realized there's a gap, nobody's studying the actual perpetrators. So he had to actually hang out with them so that he can know them. But after some time, he, when he was getting deeper, he had to declare that he's a researcher so that they would choose to open up where they want to open up. But in the first case, when he was getting entry, he went to a cafe and sat down and he was just taking, and he also browsed and we were observing what was going on. So at that time, he was just doing covert observation without declaring that he's a researcher there. Okay. The last one is simulation. Simulation is when you ask people to play, do a, a, a role play. So they do a play, they do role play for you to be able to get an idea of what they think about or how they think their views concerning a particular phenomenon that you are trying to uh, um, um, study. I think recently, um, was it BBC or somebody, they talked about this. Okay, so if I, if I can remember, I'll try to explain what they did. But what what you do here is that you try to let people act in a particular way so that people, huh, it was, it was um, I think, news file last week. There was a professor on the news file last week. He was talking about how they were using simulation to do a play in communities to be able to explain uh, what has been going on concerning Galamsey. Those of you listening to you, you remember to what I'm saying. The woman explained that that was that simulation. The woman talked about the fact that they went there, they saw that in one town, the, either chiefs or certain people were part of the thing happening. In our town, one of the chiefs have been able to fight against it. So they were trying to, and they were supposed to attend experience. They were trying to have, um, do a, let the locals do a play where they show how uh, people get into Galamse and then how Galamse is affecting them. They prepared, they, they, they did all the rehearsal, the day they were going to do a play. Because of the sensitivity of the issue, the, I think the chief on some government of um, some whatever, whether party officials uh, came and raised objection to it. They uh, set up their mics and everything ready to do the play and they prevented them from doing the play in the town. I think so, those of you listening to news five, if you didn't listen to it, on Joy FM, on Joy FM, go back and listen to you, you hear what I was telling you. <coughs> you hear what I was trying to say. So simulation is actually a, a data collection method that people use. People use so that you can be able to maybe re uh, relay a story, which is very difficult to tell. Sometimes people don't want to tell the situation. So, so in a story format, you, it will let people come to the realization that this is what is happening in our community. And then you, others may open up and tell you more. So they're using simulation to collect data. Anyway, okay. So the next, the next one, the last one has to do with um, the save, um, the other approach that has to do with the, the survey approach. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is because of the fact that qualitative researchers sometimes do mixed method study in which you may also use a survey to collect data, to be able to quantitative data to support what he's doing or, or to corroborate what he's doing or to do a parallel check of what of the findings from the quantitative and findings from the qualitative. Now, and the sampling requires you to select 
a sub um, a, a, a sub a group or a subset of a population. But because the population is quite large, it's very difficult for you to identify who is qualified to be a sample. So that process of selecting that, that sub set of a population is what we call the sam a sampling. So you end up selecting a sample from a group or a population or a, a subset of a population, which will become the foundation for your analysis, for your discussion, for even data, data um, uh, uh, collection, because you're going to focus your collection on that subgroup. So the sample is a subset of the larger population, which you are going to study to make conclusions on the population. Now, in qualitative research, our objective is not to do quantitative conclusions or statistical conclusions. We are trying to make theoretical conclusions so that we drive that if the theory says A is equal to B in the presence of C, then we will check whether A is equal to B in the presence of C in the field. If it does not work, then why is it not happening? Maybe there's a presence of E. That's why it makes it happen that way. So those relationships are what we try to determine or explore or even explain or describe within qualitative data. And then we can use that to make inference that on, so because of what you have done, whenever there's an occurrence of A, B, C, there's likely that D and E will occur. We are not trying to say that 100% of the population or 50% of the population are going through this issue. No, that is statistical generalization. We are not doing that. We are doing theoretical generalization. So we use the theoretical understanding from our conceptual framework or from our um, uh, research literature review I've done and the theoretical concepts in our literature review to be able to examine the data and make inferences or theorize and um, um, patterns. And then that pattern is what we conclude on. I hope that is well understood. Jada, I hope you can hear me. Yes, Bob. Okay, good. I told you that we start at six o'clock, so at least I'm fair because I have to finish by seven. Yeah. Okay. Any any complete group of entities which we study or we want to try to understand or predict is what we call the population. Now, when you are carrying out a sampling approach, a sampling um, um, work, you need to know who are the elements in the population. So any document that can give you a list of all the people in the element in the population is what we call the sampling frame. So if, if you are doing something for the Ghana Club 100, the list of the club 100 firms is your sampling frame. If you are sampling from the class of 20, 2023 of maybe MBA students, the list of the MBA students who are accessible to you and who are, uh, who are in the list are the ones who are going to be the sampling frame. But the, I need to point out that even though you have a sampling frame, there's, sometimes, there's something that we call a working population. For example, if I produce a list of the students in class, even though, the students may be 43. Today, as of now, I'm having 11 participants or 10 participants. So those are the ones that I can be able to, able to even use for my sample because the rest of the students are not here. So if I was carrying out any study right now, this is what I'll call my working, my working population, my working population. My working population are the ones that I'm, I have got access to. The ones that I've got access to, that's the one we call my working population. Okay, so whenever you're carrying out your sampling, you have to understand what's your sampling frame and what's the limits of your sampling frame. Okay, now we have probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Now, who can guess which of them will be for qualitative? Mm. No. The number of sampling. Okay. It's because you are hearing the word probability. You think probability is quantitative. So the number of probability will be quite qualitative. <laughs> but you can have somebody do probability sampling and use it in a qualitative sense. You can have somebody. I just want to tell you that. So don't be surprised somebody does. The probability sampling is that somebody knows the, the the nth, knows the uh, uh, there is a known non non zero probability for selecting, selecting every element. So supposing there are six phases of a die or six students in a class. If I choose one, if I'm going to select three students, that means that there's, what, three, uh, um, uh, how many, there could be three out of um, six of uh, six students I can pick up, I can pick up from that, from that student, no, from that particular population. And then out, three out of um, six times, no, three times out of six, I may be able to pick three students out of it. That maybe could, could be my mom probability. So the no probability is the how many, how many the how many times that you is possible to select a, a member from that particular uh, uh, sample. 
So if I've got a thousand pebbles and I put my finger into it, I've got one out of a thousand opportunities of choosing one person. Do you understand me? Now, if I choose that person and I don't replace that person, now I've got one out of nine, 999. So out of the three students, I, I, the six students I want to select, if I'm choosing only three of them, so I go to the first one, I choose one. So now it's now five. I go to the second one, I choose one. So every time I choose, then the probability of selecting somebody become reduces because of the number that the population reducing. Now, with a no probability sampling, there's no potential number that you can calculate of or determine or predetermine that I will be able to select this person. Because of the fact that the focus of no probability sampling is not to do a statistical measure of the population, it's to try to be able to choose people who are got understanding of the particular phenomenon you want to study. So it, the, and that their understanding of the phenomenon is more important to you than their end position in the some in the population. So in the quantitative, in quantitative studies, our objective is to get a representative sample of the population. So we, we call something stratified sampling quantitative, where supposing that you are choosing, um, you have got 200 students in University of um, 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 Nebraska, Nebraska or um, University of, let's say, uh, uh, um, Lagos. And then in that University of Lagos, out of the 20 students, they tell you that 10% of the students or 20% of the students are Ghanaians, the rest are Nigerians. Now, when you say 20% of the students are Ghanaian, there are 200 of them, that gives you how many? 20% of, of 200 is how much? Class 40. 40. So 40 students are Ghanaians, 160 students are Nigerians. Suppose you're supposed to select 10 students. If you go into it and just select the test, yes, but there's high likelihood that you never select a Ghanaian. Is that not true? Yes, please. is that not true? Yes, sir. Good. Yes. Because even with the 160, then 10 divided by 160 divided by 10 is 16 times. On 16 times, you may be able to choose from the 160 without even touching any Ghanaian. Do you realize? Yes, please. Good. So to be able to make sure that you have got everybody in the strata, the strata are the subgroups within the population, within that particular one. Stratified sampling, which is usually used by a quantitative group, tells you that because you want to have a representative representation of the population within your sample, you also find the 10 people you want to have, 20% of 10 is how much? Four. Um, Zelda, I think you have you have to un unmute yourself so that we can talk, so that we can go faster. So 20% of 10 is how much, Zelda? It's two, bro. It's two, okay, so two. So it means that two of the students have to be uh, Ghanaians and then of your 10, and then um, um, what's the name? The eight students have to be Nigerians. So in such a, a scenario, what you do is that you will choose the 10, the eight students out of the 160, and you choose the two students out of the Ghanaians, which are 40. Then by the time you get your 10, you have got a good representation of the same sample. And that's what we call representative sample from the population. So in that means that you have used stratified sampling to identify the structures in the, in the population to make sure that they are represented in your study. Do you understand me? Yes, bro. Good. Yes, bro. Good. Yes. Now, but when it comes to qualitative, it's not like that. Qualitative is not about representation. Qualitative is more about understanding. So who has experienced the issue that can give you understanding about what you are trying to do? So you, in qualitative sampling, you try to use methods which is not based on random sampling technique or randomization. You are, you are, so your sample size is not known from, about, from the beginning. Although we say that in qualitative, a minimum of 15 is good. Uh, 15 to 25 is good for any good study so that you can have some kind of differences in their opinions. Now, what I'm, but it depends. If they are interviewing an SME, the SME is only about only five employees. Yeah, you are stuck with the five. The only way you can be able to extrapolate to 15 is to start talking to the customers of the SME and then talk to the um, um, other, other founding members or other, other, other suppliers and other trading partners. Then you can be able to build a whole large community of more than 25 or even 25 or even 15. Now, probability sampling, there are quite a number of approaches. One of them is called haphazard sampling. 
A partial sampling means that you actually try to do the sampling out of convenience so to people who are within the proximity of you. So you are trying to do a, you are doing a study on students and their views concerning doing a PhD in the University of Ghana. And you are talking, as I'm talking right now, students are in the class. So why don't I just start standing in the class and start administering my questionnaire? So you are, con you are a convenient sample to me. To me, you are conveniently accessible to me. Do you understand me? So let's take uh, um, uh, uh, Desmond Kumi. Desmond Kumi uh, maybe uh, lives in Kumasi. So Desmond is trying to do a, a, a study. But because I, I am teaching him and giving an assignment, he's not in Accra. And he doesn't have access to you. The only way he can get access to the class is to do the sampling from you in the class, but interview you through internet. But then he, but he wants to do face-to-face -face interviews or do focus group discussions with you guys. So you rather get go to Kane University, which is closer to him, or go to Garden, uh, Garden City University or any other, I don't remember the universities in Kumasi, but any of the other universities in Kumasi, and then go and, and talk to the students there and then collect the data from them. In that sense, that those who are conveniently accessible to this month is what he's using them for study. Okay. Now the challenge with that particular one, we call, we call it haphazard because there's no defined formula and you may end up getting bias, a bias in the study. So for example, University of Ghana, so you are doing that study on students' views concerning um, concerning um, doing PAD in University of Ghana. What if the, a, a directive comes from the vice chancellor that there's an increase in school fees and that money just show up and you're going to do convenient sampling? All the students will be biased, will be biased or maybe maybe angry with you because of the conditions of, 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 of what is happening within the particular uh, um, um, context of where, where you're collecting your data. So some of the radio stations guy doing that, they come out of the radio station, start on the street and start interviewing people. And what do you think about the budget? What do you think about the budget? Now, if a, Ghanaian, a set of Ghanaians are mocking in front of you, maybe somebody is driving students and uh, uh, people from, let's say, uh, uh, Medina to a circle and they, their car breaks down in front of CTFM. CTFM responder, respondent comes out. Now the people who are in their car are people who are sellers and they are buyers and they are not the economists. They are not no economists. And they, 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 all they hear, we're listening to in radio was increase in pure water. That morning, as you go out there and do the interview, the reactions will be very, very polarized. However, if it was a group of maybe academics who are going to a, um, a conference at maybe National Theater, they pass through a circle and they drove through CTFM. They say, oh, this is CTFM. Let's get down and just chat. With them. Or you maybe they want to do have some lunch in front of that place. They, they, they sell some maybe banana or um, um, I know Ghanaians is surprisingly like buying coffee book. Man, this cocoa, uh, the plantain that they have uh, with granite. So those top, a big car, you see a, a BMW 5 Series will pack and they buy coffee book. Man, sometimes very surprising. So those pack, pack and then, <laughs> and then <laughs> I'm a researcher, so I, I, I observe a lot. So you, you pack this car, this car um, coming from campus economics, the economic lectures, and then people from, let's say, uh, marketing and department and all kinds of other departments pack there and they are eating coffee book, man. And then CTFM comes out. Now these are academics. When you ask them questions concerning maybe pure water change in price and uh, their view, you know, over analyzing somebody will say that you see when inflation went up by 2% and when you went to buy grapes and all kinds of stuff, by the time you finish analyzing, you don't even understand what they have said. But that's what they will do. So their biasness can come because the sample cannot be predetermined in their condition. You don't know whether they know, they may not even have any knowledge about the issue. So somebody is very hot, he was going to pay his rent. And you stop him and you ask him about this guy, you may even slap you. <laughs> his view and his issues and his emotionally charged at that time. So cut, uh, doing a study uh, from the convenience sample approach can sometimes really lead to an unrepresented sample. An uh, unrepresentative, uh, unrepresentative sample in qualitative research means that they don't even have an understanding of the issue. So they are not the best people to be able to give you a good feedback. Now, we also have a, a, a judgmental or judgment uh, or purposive sampling. This is what every qualitative researcher, research student who doesn't know what he's doing, like saying, what did you do? I did purposive sampling. What did you do? I did purposive sampling. What did you do? The, you, well, explain the purposive sampling. Can't even explain it. Now, a purposive sampling means that you should have some knowledge about appropriate characteristics of the sample so that you can be able to collect data, uh, collect information about them. So, for example, if you want to do a study on uh, on on unique uh, cases that uh, unique cases that have been going on in Ghana, for example, a failed development project like um, some of the rules uh, implementation, 
and then there's a that you want to be able to uh, um, interview people related to that issue. That actually, that, that it means they have to find a project in which they failed in the in that particular uh, project, so they can collect data from them. So if you don't find a failed project, you cannot be able to get re relevant information concerning your data, your work. The same way, if you want to focus on students who have got um, 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 people who are difficult to reach in society, like prostitutes, you can't sit in a classroom and say they are studying for prostitutes. If you start asking questions in the class, maybe somebody will even slap you. If you have to go to where to where prostitutes gather or uh, can be found, so you can reach them and ask them questions. So in this particular sense, it means that a purposive sampling approach requires you, the researcher, to know certain criteria that you want to be able to um, find within the, 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 the respondents so that you can be able to narrow down on them. So it's purpose driven. It's driven by the purpose of the study so that you, you are able to select members who have knowledge about the issue you want to do the research on. Now, that is very different from convenience and convenience sampling. You are, you are not very sure. You just show up those who are conveniently accessible to you. But purposive has to be much more targeted and focus to on those who have got understanding of what you're trying to do so that they may be really give you relevant information. You will not go and study a successful project and say you are trying to understand a field failure in, uh, in development project. You don't want to go and study uh, the best accounting firm in Ghana when you want to say you want to study when you your objective of studying and uh, doing the study your, your research is on bad account or bad accounting or on toward accounting practices. Now why would you take it to the best accounting firm in Ghana? Because the label on them it connotes the fact that they have been adhering to almost all the accounting principles and laws and rules within the discipline. So why would you go to them? So whenever you are doing proposal sampling, you should understand the, what you're trying to study so that you cho choose members or cases that fit the purpose. Now, we have to also appreciate the fact that, okay, let me, let me I don't want to jump, let me continue. Then there's no so sampling. So power sampling means it's a reputational sampling, referral sampling. Now, this type of network sampling or referral sampling starts from the fact that you find one person who has knowledge about the issue and the person refers you to the next person. So it means that you may either begin from random sampling by randomly sampling somebody or by purposive. You are trying to do study on, um, um, on people's perception, consumer perception on made in Ghana cars. The best thing for you to do is to purposively select somebody who knows who has a made in Ghana car and then you then he may then point you to the next person or you go straight to a made in Ghana car company and they may give you access to their customers. And as customers are buying their car and going out, you may want to do an exit interview with them. So yeah, then as one person talks to you, they tell you, I know another person in another bank. I know this other person in another bank. So that's where the snowballing starts from. The snowballing is the act that they refer you to another resp uh, 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 respondent that you can be able to collect data from that respondent. Now it could also happen in the in, in industry too. When you're doing an industry study, you talk to one expert and he links you to another expert, who links you to another expert, who refers you to another expert. So in that kind of referral approach is what you call snowballing. So your samplings, your sampling, your, your sample size increases as you, you are snowballed to different people who have got relevant information for your study. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that you have access to all of them. Somebody can snowball you to someone and you may not be able to have access to the person. And the last one I'll talk about before I break into another view and another issue is what we call deviant sampling. Deviant sampling means that you want cases that differ from the dominant pattern. You are realizing that students who um, come to, students who are, let me give you an example. So when I gave the first assignment and I was looking, um, the time was up, some students called me from a particular department telling me that they are finished the assignment they want, and they were thinking I should make it available for them to be able to upload. They're asking a question about uploading. Now, but when we came to class, we realized that some students have not even started. Now, in this scenario, the dominant pattern have not started. The deviants are the one, which is not a bad word in this sense. The deviants are the ones who are still part of the class, but they have gone ahead to finish the two assignments or three assignments ahead, and they are looking for opportunity to upload. Whilst others are even after four weeks, five weeks, are still begging that, oh, prof, open up, open up, or oh, open up, open up. And whenever you open up, they will ask for another opening up. Now in this scenario, you realize that the different sample are the ones that oh, select people who have actually been able to go ahead and finish their work. 
So the dominant party are not finishing their work, but the deviants are the ones who have been able to finish their work. Now your study will, will like to focus on the deviants to know that even though you are all exposed to the same conditions, what makes these students exceptional and being able to finish their work on time? So the research then focuses on that some small sample size or that set of people who are who deviate from the norm. I hope you, are, you understand what I'm trying to say. So those students who deviate from the we call them the deviant sample. Okay. So somebody can use deviant sampling to be able to identify those who deviate from the norm. Now, why is this sampling approach important? It's important because sometimes in your, in your research work, you may come across a lot of um, 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 a large number of people in the population. You are studying a phenomenon. For example, I'm doing a study in the northern region. I'm trying to study people who are into share now. And we are that's the thing that we are trying to do. We are trying to understand how um, 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 the share value chain and the role technology impacts the role of technology in the share value chain. But we also want to make inference on people. If you just go to the field and just study only those in the share value chain, it will give you one perspective of the issue. Now, there's a likelihood that there are people who are in the share business and have exited. So those could be another group you could look into. And there are people too who have never been attracted to share business. And those people could, be, could also be another group that you can understand. And there are those who, who are very, because of the way share is quite seasonal, there's a time that the thing is, um, it, is, is right for collection. And that time there's a fallow period. So the tree has to grow and then and, 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 and get, in, get into a, 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 a time of fruition. Now, when it gets into a time of dryness, People move to other crops like soya bean and other crops that they will go and they go and trade in that one. So later on, by the time um, the share season is back, then they go back to share to go for share picking. Now, if you don't understand these dynamics, your data will think that only those who are into share are those who are there every day in share. But you may not realize that if you show up, it may be around February, February, December to February. You may not find any many people in share. Because maybe that may be the follow-up period that others have gone into soya bean and other sorghum and other rice or something else. But if you go into go at another time, that's the time you see people um, exit and uh, doing more in share. So, like the parable that we looked at about at the or qualitative research, what we looked at about at the beginning of the, the semester, you have to understand that the context itself can also shape the way respondents behave. So here I need to be able to look at the seasonality of share and be able to select my Respondents. Number two, I have to understand this respondents. Some of them may have been in it and some of them have gone out. I also have to understand that there are some who have not entered into share before. So if I do my study and study on only those who are in share, at the time I showed up, I maybe have a skewed perspective of the issue. It is better for me to be able to look at those who, who are outside, are deviant to what I want to, the dominant pattern I want to study, but may also help me to be able to appreciate what makes them different. Somebody may have been, have been in share for about seven years, and after that has exited and gone into something else, and he's not doing it anymore. In fact, I know somebody who was used to plant share, and now he's a lecturer in the University of Ghana Business School. He has stopped the share, he's now, he's now a lecturer in, he has now exited, say 15 years ago, he was a share farmer, and now he's a lecturer in the So that, there are different scenarios. So if you just look at the dominant pattern, you will be, have a skewed set of results. I'm, 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 and, and I think students, from, I don't see this one in Vivas a lot, where students have their lay sample and they have a deviant sample. So I'm challenging you that as you are preparing your PhD work, you should don't just think about the dominant sample that you want to try to look at also the deviant sample who can give you another perspective of the issue you are trying to study. Especially for qualitative research, it's very helpful to get a rich, to encourage, to enhance the richness of your findings. Now, the last part is what we call strategic selection of cases. Now, the reason I'm bringing this one is that, you see, all the sampling approach I've mentioned, they look at, they tend to look like sampling approach, which is at an individual level. But sometimes you have to sample at the, at the at more of a meso level before you go into a micro level, where the micro is an individual, where the meso is the firm. So also or a firm is or the community. So if, let's say that you're got, uh, I'm doing, you are doing a study on, on, on a woman's, woman's uh, self-selection into entrepreneurship. And then you, you want to do it in, let's say, in rural communities in Ghana. Now, which communities are you going to select? So that means that you have to sample at the community level before you sample the individuals within the community. 
Now, if you're not very careful, you will think that you use the for the individual level, for the firm and for the community level and go to use individual. It may not work because of the fact that it may do have different parameters of, 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 of selection. So there's something called the strategic selection of cases, which some others call the theoretical selection approach. Now, all of that means that you actually have to establish certain characteristics about what you're trying to study so that your theoretical assumptions are in line with what you want to do. In my PhD, I did this. Now, we tend to say that the external, the external validity of case studies can be argued to be enhanced by strategic selection of cases rather than their statistical selection. I mentioned about statistical selection earlier. It entails being someone knowledgeable about characteristics of the case before the main or proper case study begins. So let me give you, I'm just walking through the process so that you can understand and I'll open my PhD and we can then look at it further. So with, with respect to this study, data collection was scheduled in, scheduled in two stages, consisting of a pilot study that helped me to understand the firms that took place between April 26 to June 2006. And the main study that took place between October 10th to December 15th. Now, the objective of the pilot study was to first explore the relevance of my research questions and propositions and obtain a conceptual clarification of the research design for, of this research study. Second, identify and screen potential firms for the main case study. So when I finished, I think I got about 13 firms from that. And then I had to now come on back and then lose strategic selection case to narrow down to what I want to use. This required a preliminary investigation of the e-commerce adoption at the firm level to ascertain the relevance of our theoretical propositions and third, to ascertain the extent of e-commerce assimilation in Ghana. So that's the reason why I did a pilot study. Now, let's go to my PhD and look at and, and, and understand some things from there. Um, okay. It's loading, so just one second. Okay. Please, if you have a question, I will answer it. Just give me a few minutes. Because we have to finish at seven, I want to spend some time explaining something before um, um, I switch to question. Then I'll, but at seven o'clock, I can close. Okay. Okay, so let's look at it from here. Um, good. Okay, I want to go chapter five. Case of oh, okay. So case study as a research method, case study design, selection of cases. Okay, so this is it. So look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit for those who need to see it well. Uh, forgive me, forgive me. Okay, so this is what we have here. So let's see it here. Good. Now, with reference to my pilot study, organizations were selected, selected were obtained from Ghana Club 100 and referrals from internet service providers. So I needed to understand the firms that are there. And I was taking a, a, um, a selection from that. So I went on to say that uh, the Ghana Club 100 I explained the Ghana Club 100 and then and the different type of films and why they get into the Ghana Club 100. Okay. Now, 50 organizations were conducted for my pilot study. 35 of them were selected from the Ghana Club 100 for manufacturing, agriculture, trading and services, financial institution, and hospitality. 10 of the 35 organizations, um, um, 35 Club 100 organizations responded, out of which four were interviewed for the pilot study. And then, Eight other firms who were not listed in the Ghana Club 100 and an association were also interviewed. In the hands, 22 interviews with 12 firms and one an industry, industry association, that's Ghana uh, AGI, were, were done in the pilot study. Okay. The key finding in the pilot studies were suggestive. That's why I found some things in the pilot study that I finished. Now, when I finished that, I need to now go into my theoretical selection because I found a number of firms. Now, so listen to very care carefully from here. Though the findings do not change our initial research questions and proposition, they focus the research into exploring the interaction between intangible and tangible resources and the impact of managerial capabilities on e-commerce adoption and benefits creation. 
In relating these findings to our strategic selection of cases for main study, our objective was to select cases which will provide valid and challenging tests and explanation for our theory and our theoretical research propositions. Case study researchers have noted this as theoretical sampling. Okay, by strength or focus sampling by Hakim. We select cases because they had particular characteristics which are related to our theoretical propositions. So that's what we call theoretical sampling. Now this is different from purpose, and this is at the case level, not at the individual level. We don't do theoretical sampling for individuals at the case level. The implications of our findings to our, of these findings to our strategic case selection for the main study were, so I wanted firms one, in terms of maturity and outcome, firms that have adequate, after I've done my pilot and I got go to understand what is happening in Ghana. So in line to my, my, my research questions are divided into, into two groups, questions on resource, outcome and impact and question resource input and development. So to be able to satisfy that, I'm tying it to my research framework to which has also got resource outcome and impact and resource input and development. So I said maturity and outcome, firms that have adequate time to adopt and experience e-commerce benefits that impact on their performance and range of case experiences from e-commerce success to e-commerce failure. So you see, I'm doing DVR sampling here. I don't want only those who are successful. I also want those who have failed before. So it doesn't mean that all the firms should have succeeded in e-commerce, or maybe at some point in time they failed. So this is where deviant sampling has become supportive of what I'm doing. I'm combining it with my theoretical sampling. Can you see it, Obed? Can you see? You may need it for your PhD. So can you see that? Yes, bro. I can. Yeah. Then extent of adoption, existence of historical account of developing from basic to advanced. Now, in my theory, my PhD theorization, I've pointed out that. E-commerce has got different levels. There's the basic level of e-commerce and advanced. So I don't want firms that are just advanced, but a firm that can give me a history of how they develop from this low e-commerce to a more high transactional e-commerce. If you go and take firms that can only tell you of how they arrived at transactional, you will not get that longitudinal story approach for you to do analysis of how you build capabilities. The study wanted to understand how you combine resources and capabilities to be able to get the benefits and to get value from e-commerce. So that's a historical process. You can't just study it at the, at, the, at the end. So I need a company that can give me a story. And those companies are very few. So somebody will say that, why didn't you get MTN? Because maybe I couldn't get a story from MTN, but I could get a story from maybe Car Bank. So I will focus on Car Bank where I can look at the story. And they may give me access. Somebody may be good, but they may not give you access to get a story. Number, 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 number three, resource portfolio. Co co covering firms with different resource strength, but achieving e-commerce success. So you want to see that firms who have been able to also use different strengths. So for example, I was able to see firms who didn't have sophisticated e-commerce so much, but were achieving value from it. And so it helped me to understand that you may not have the most advanced form of e-commerce like credit card and stuff, but you are getting value and maybe making almost 10,000 pounds, that time to $10,000 a year. And that was a lot of money from e-commerce alone. Even though you're not having credit card and all those kind of stuff. Now, market covering both export and domestic companies that have a business that time that requires them to do export and import. Now, why was that important to me? Because I wanted, you see, the way e-commerce is, is about trade. So when a person is supposed at that time, we're not looking at internal e-commerce, but trade within Ghana. We're talking about trade across the country. So you want a firm that by virtue of his, his business activity, he has international partners who he has to connect with. So that the e-commerce will be real. So if you don't understand your phenomenon and you don't appreciate the, the conceptualization of your phenomenon, selection of your films can be very, very difficult, especially, especially if you want to do theoretical sampling. Now, with reference to the main study, it was intended that four films will be interviewed for the main case study. The first was Lanka Consult that was selling cars online. The second was Casapreco, that was the manufacturer of beverages, but Casapreco had been able to export their beverages into Nigeria and they were selling in Nigeria and in Liberia. And they were also importing ethanol and other products from outside. So they have international partnership, so that will qualify them. Kofian Bank, that was um, Amar Bank at that time, which was a Nigerian bank operating in Ghana. So that one to show, show, um, show, show interest in that area. Then Mikili Drinks Limited, that is um, um, a fan bill. That was also, Van Milk at that time had a franchise to be able to do, um, not all the products were their own original um, uh, um, original formula. They were getting some franchise from some Netherlands company to be able to do some of the, I think, I don't know whether it was 
one of them, that can pick or something like that. So they had also got some international relationships. Now, however, the researcher was able to look, you know, these were the ones I narrowed down from, from my pilot study. However, the researcher was able, able to get access to the first two firms, that's the car company and the Casa Preco, for the main study. Why? Because in view, this is the reality we want. Sometimes you don't capture the real things. They make it look as if they went to the field and everybody was sitting there and said yes. But that is not very true. That's not very true. Even quantitative will tell you, this one, if I'm right, you may admit a questionnaire and get 70% uh, uh, response. Means that 30% didn't even respond or you couldn't even use their data. Even the 70% who responded, it's not all of them who are, some of them are just taken. So you may even the ones that you can even use after getting 70% result, response, the one that you can even use is only 60%. That's why I'm all right. He's quiet. Okay, maybe let's continue. Or oh, he's asleep. <laughs> okay, this one. So, no problem, problem. I'm right here. Okay. The internet. Yes, I agree, bro. Yeah. In view of Ghana's uh, 50th anniversary in 2007, remember the date I gave you that I collected my data was in 2006. The anniversary was in 2007. So look at how an external event can affect your data connection. Most Ghanaian firms like Mickley Drinks, that's a farm dog, were engaged in planning activities for potential business opportunities that could arise from, they could like, take advantage of. Kofi and Bank was undergoing business and management restriction after entering into a partnership with the Nigerian financial institution. So Alma Bank, was then becoming B, I think they then became BOA, if I'm right, Bank of Africa. So the Nigerian bank was buying them. Okay. The time they were Amal Bank, it was a Ghanaian ownership, and I had access to them. In fact, I wrote my first paper in my life based on them. The new management was instituted by a number of old money, was instituted, was to be instituted as a number of old management retired. In fact, it's true, quite a number of them were from Bank of Housing and Oak, all the other old banks in Ghana who had formed that bank. So they, they, got the, they got a good payout and they left. As a result, another firm, just Jesmond has listed fabrics and garments, just had not they gone. In, in textile and garment subsector, that's the one I was saying, they're making a lot of money without even having credit card from, from selling products to um, Ghanaians living in the diaspora. Textile and garment subsector was selected. Hence the list of the main case organizations were these three. Though there may not be correct number of cases appropriate for the case design, the more complex our prediction, the more confident we can be in a single case where our predictions are replicated. This said, this is from critical realism, from divorce and critical realism. Now, this said, it's important to echo that this research is not a survey. Remember, I told you, research, that's six statistical significance. This is critical realism research. As I explained earlier, our objective, objective is to generalize on on the ability, or what's supposed to be? On the ability of the constituent properties or analyzing causal mechanism to causal, a cause and a right casual. <laughs> causal mechanisms, this is affected me to my PhD, mixing causal and casual. <laughs> causal mechanisms to explain particular occurrence of the phenomena. We, as we as examine the explanatory power, power of our causal mechanisms, underlining the occurrence of the phenomena. So you are in strategic case selection and critical realism. You are not looking for statistical, statistical conclusions or statistical prediction and generalization. You're looking for the ability for what you say can cause this thing to, uh, to happen, to be actually be there. So you remember what you said here, we are more confident when our predictions can be replicated, that you can see it in case A and see it in case B. So rather than a large number of cases, our focus was more on strategic cases to explain, understand, and test our propositions. On a lesser note, we also have to also consider that what is practical within a constraint of time, money, and access to relevant cases. I'm trying to say that sometimes there may be other good friends, but because of the time and money, we could have even been in Kumasi and stuff. I may not have had time to be able to go and do that. So further, while we adopt the strategic selection cases, the choice of this organization does not compromise the triangulation of data. Our objective in triangulation was to establish that is about the data collection level. You see, the fact that you have done strategic selection does not mean that your data collection is already okay. You, are just, you have to also do purposive in selecting the members of the people who answer the questions for the firm. Because customer is big. They may be up about 200 employees. So who are you going to interview? So you have to be purposive in nature in selecting who should be interviewed. Maybe you need the sales manager, you need the marketing manager, you need a manufacturing manager, you need the operations manager, you need the MD, you need the HR manager. Maybe this is, or you may need to go to the, 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 the manufacturing line to observe yourself. 
you may need to look at some of their financials. For example, the lack of the, the automobile company, I went to the harbor to see how they clear a car. Because you are talking about the thing that the papers come and the papers are sent by DHL. So all of these partners, I went to DHL with the person to see. I went to sit with the person at um, uh, the Den Ridge Hospital. And, and he, in the, you are selling, most of his, the people you are selling the cars to were um, uh, medical doctors who are buying C, C120. Yes, that's what, those were the cars. If you, those of you remember, there was a time that medical students, medical officers were crazy about C120. I didn't even know what was about that car. Anyway, but they liked that best. They liked it a lot. And if anybody here can explain why they love, fell in love with that car a lot. Okay. Now, so we will go and then they will explain to us that they will make a choice. So they'll make a choice on the car. They will choose from the pictures. And then the next day, he'll bring the, the specs on the car to them. They will look at it. That time, there's no tablet. You carry your laptop. You open, your, they'll open the computer. They, they'll sit at the outside uh, the, the hospital and they'll do that. Then one doctor will buy it and they'll refer to another doctor. So I, I went through my data collection, working with the, the company head, trying to experience what it is about using e-commerce to be able to sell cars online. The same thing to, um, um, to Casapreco, spent two weeks in Casapreco. The same thing with just one, spent, people, um, spent time with their, on their shopping line, spending time interacting with them, even interacting with some of their partners abroad. So until you are part of it doing both observation doing artifact examination where you are actually examining maybe a website and going through, seeing whether the process of pictures is the same as the process that you may understand as the person told you. All of this to go to the, even sometimes the, the operational, uh, the, uh, the factory to talk to operation line managers to see what they are telling. Because you, you may not realize it, the line manager, what he does affects what you put on the internet. So you have to understand how he interprets. For example, I was, being in, to be able to, for me to be able to um, talk to Jesmont Fabrics, Jesmont Fabrics snowballed me to ATL. So I want to spend time with ATL to understand why they don't do much online. And they said, if you put it online, people copy it in, in China, and then the next week, they tend to be on, on the market. So they're not doing much online on that time. But they realized that they still cannot stop being, being offline. They have to come online. So they use a different strategy, which I can discuss later. But all of these things was to enhance my understanding of what I'm trying to do. Okay, so the triangulation from all of these things and from the uh, uh, triangulation from, in, we did internal triangulation with the firm, interviews with different managers and project reports, review of project reports and document, external triangulation with other stakeholders and commentator. Then methodological triangulation from observation and website document analysis, what we call artifact examination. These, these measures facilitated internal and external validity of the cases and provided rigor and comprehensiveness needed for a, uh, um, for, uh, an analysis from an, is a critical realism perspective. The data collection processes were discussed in, de uh, discussed in detail in the next section. So that one, I go, I go to the data collection. We'll do that one later next time. But what am I trying to emphasize here? So sampling is important. You need to appreciate what your, your phenomenon is and which of the sampling approaches you, do, you are going to use. You need to appreciate that sometimes you need to sample at the case level or the firm level or the community level before you come and sample the individuals. So most of the time, students in presenting their PhD only talk about the purposive sampling they did in selecting the respondents. They don't rather talk about the case that they selected. I've seen somebody's PhD, which the lady nearly failed because I was the, I was the chairman of that PhD. And she was doing a PhD on, on, on something on family-owned businesses. And when they asked her that, so all the firms that are in the family-owned business among Ghana Club 100, the category you're looking at, how many are they? They say 12. So how do you narrow to the four you have selected? And you're talking about, oh, I talked to them and I talked to them. I said that, and I remember the, that the then um, pro vice chancellor was sitting at that meeting. And then he said something like, so what scientific methodology or technique did you use to reduce from 12 to four? The lady couldn't answer it. And he was just going round, 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 round. All she kept on talking about, and then I purposely selected the members and the said, You said, you know, we know the members, but why did you choose FEM A and B? How do you believe 12 to 4? <laughs> That's when I realized that sometimes students do there's a gap in understanding how the, the firm or the, or the community can be selected. So please understand it very, very well. Understand where to apply the level of analysis that you apply sampling. What in case you are doing a study in the whole Africa, by what means are you going to choose Ghana and Nigeria? 
So what sampling approach are you going to use to select Ghana and Nigeria? Before you, you narrow down into Ghana and then choose the firms in Ghana and narrow down to Nigeria and choose the firms in Nigeria, then go into the firm to choose the individuals you want to interview. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope, I wish there would be a day that I could show you different research and different sampling strategies that we use. Sometimes all the strategies have to be used <laughs> because there's no one formula that will let it work to, because you want respondents. Almost all different strategies have to be used. Thank you very, very much at seven o'clock. So I'll take one or two questions and then we come about out. Okay, I don't think there's a question in the room. I thought there was a question in the chat room. Oh, but do you have a question yourself? Bro, my hand is up. Oh, sorry, I'll see two yeah. hands up. I do, I'm not looking oh, at wait, 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 wait. Justice can go first and when he's not. Okay. Bro, yeah. thank you very much. Prof, please, based on my experience from student presentation at the business school, I've realized that most of the students doing qualitative research, normally we, we use purposive sampling. And uh, when it comes to the sample size, they normally will not really state a sample size. But no, so we don't state a sample size. You arrive, the sample size is emergent. Yeah, but so, so uh, normally the statement is that the data will be collected to a point of saturation. So they may yes. do five, six, and may claim that they have reached a uh, saturation level. Is that empirically justifiable? So saturation level means that at, um, you have reached a point that any, any data you collect is not telling you anything new. But it also depends on how you sample your respondents. If your respondents are skewed from coming from the same classroom, then any day you will get to saturation very fast. Do you understand me? Yes. Good. So. All right. You have to be careful about how you def the, the students sometimes they are la they lazy out in their explanation. That's why they just say that. But um, you have to be careful how you say. Oh, but please make this slide. I think I've saved it in the folder. Make it the slide available to them. And the, and then last week's going to which of them? Okay. Okay. Probably well, every session I update some of them a little bit. So just just make it available. Okay. Now what yes, I wanted I wanted to show uh, show to him. He asked a question. Very good question. I want to show something to him. When I was showing, um, this, explaining something to you on respondent selection, and I told you a different type of respondents, even today I, I went over it again. Okay, now look at something here, then I can, um, I'll take obese question close. Look at this. So this is what the person, look at 72, it's emergent. He didn't, so, and I remember I told you it's between 15 to 18. So each organization did eight, 15 to 25. So he did 18, 18, 18, 18. This one, he even did the regulators, he didn't even do the regulators in the industry, like maybe educational minister, people from medical, uh, um, um, educational services, or maybe NGOs working in education. Maybe it was not relevant, but he could have extended it to look at um, other external stakeholders, which may be relevant in industry, industry stakeholders. But this one was purely, he was doing some, she was doing something on mobile learning, and she was focusing on only the private sector institutions and the public sector institutions. So that's what he looked into. For example, if Ghana had a policy of mobile learning, you would have to talk to policymakers in that scenario. Do you understand it? Gentlemen. So that's what the kind of breakdown we are looking for from you. Yes, Obed. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. So my, my, my question has to do with the, the theoretical sampling. Mm -hmm. um, reading on it, I get a sense that it's it's associated with grounded theory. And um, so, no, don't, don't say that. It's associated with grounded theory because grounded, uh, grounded theories also, also mentioned it. So let me just give an example. I'm a critical realist. If I start talking about theoretical sampling in my work, you end up thinking that theoretical sampling is for me. Okay. Okay, bro. I just want to... So it means that it is it is uh, it is not only used for grounded theory research. That's what I'm trying to say. That you, did you look at what I, I showed to you? Maybe you didn't read what I showed to you. Where's my page? Sometimes selection of cases has got different ways people explain it as. Maybe you, you didn't even look at it. So here it is saying that it is called theoretical sampling as explained like Glazer and Strauss. This is Gandhi theory guy. And focus yes, sampling as by Hakim. And then strategic selection cases as by a um, divorce or somebody. So everybody has a way he calls it. 
Okay. But, the, but the word theoretical sampling came because of Glazer them you proposed it as that. That's why you say it's called Grenet theory. But they are, they are all, they are similar and different authors have postulated them. So the same uh, 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 theoretical sampling, somebody calls it focus sampling by Hakim. And somebody will go to such a selection of cases in divorce or somebody else. Yeah, I think divorce. So, but they are all the same thing. They are talking about the same thing. Yes, look at, here. Look at here. It's here. A set of a of cases has been argued to be enhanced by a certain selection of cases. That rather, is it that strategic selection is by divorce here. Okay. Bro. I even give you the page number. So if Jin also talked about something similar to his, what do you say? So you may end up having in 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 in, 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 in qualitative in, in fact in research analysis and in, or in analyze analysis of data, many people have different techniques, but the techniques could be very similar. So if you are using, you have to mention whose own you are using. That's why you are very, very careful, you know what you are doing. You yourself, just uh, Obed, don't you know that um, Braun and Clark are the one for thematic analysis? But yes, I can't tell you people papers that have used than thematic analysis, and they are quoted other authors. They never quoted Bond and Clark because Bond and Clark's explanation is what somebody thought it to be more, more simple for others to use. But I can also apply it in a particular unique way. And you say that uh, uh, thematic analysis, as explained by Boatin. Okay, bro. Hmm. I hope you understand me. Yes, bro. Number three, did you see that? You didn't see something. This is in 1967. Then somebody came back and looked at that idea, extended it a little bit, and made a body find it and called it focus sampling in 1986. Then another person in 2001 came up with something and called it uh, 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 strategic selection in 2001. So the name is progressively changing. <laughs> so it's the same concept, but it's just that people are, are it's a changing technique. how. It's a technique, not a concept, it's a technique. And the technique means that you focus, use your theory to guide you in selection of your cases. Okay, bro. So somebody may use it, say, I use focus sampling, and they call it focus sampling. And he may add something else. And somebody calls it, in fact, somebody can even explain purposive sampling that you hear about it. There are about different, there are about six different versions of purposive sampling. I don't want to just get into it. And somebody may explain purposive and come and write, I write and say that the theoretical purposive sampling is, is what, uh, 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 is what a divorce calls static selection. So now he's calling theoretical purposes something. <laughs> <laughs> Please, okay, did I tell you that you have to get away from terminologies and understand the principle? Because terminologies will cre create a problem. Yesterday we had a MacBook driver. They asked somebody what is theoretical framework and what is conceptual framework. You saw the person got confused. <laughs> yes, bro. <laughs> and even the letter himself was very strategic in the way he asked the question. Not, not giving away his position of the answer. But letting the student look very funny in front of him. <laughs> and the student now said this and got confused and confused himself and herself while she's standing there. She didn't even believe in what she knew already. Because of the way when when you they ask your question eh, and you are not very confident about that's why know who, you, who who is backing you, who is your support. So that when you are defending your, your position, you know that you know it from the literature, not because you just know it. So okay. when you understand the technique. Understand how different researchers have used the technique. So that when you are defending yourself, you can give three people. There's something quantitative research that says that uh, you cannot go straight to confirmatory analysis. You have to pass through exploratory. And then some people came later and told you that you can, in certain circles, you can jump exploratory analysis and go straight to confirmatory analysis. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Now. Yes, so one of what uh, Dr. Bati was doing a PhD and a viva, they asked her that why did she jump exploratory and went to confirmatory? She had backed about seven different senior authors to explain that under this and this circumstance, because of your data, you jump exploratory to go to confirmatory. Now, it was at a viva that somebody, a mock viva, somebody asked her, and she didn't know how to explain that. When she went, she told her, go and look, look for all the other authors because. When you look at the, the work, uh, somebody will tell you that you don't need this one, but you need this one. So if you don't get some senior boys to support you and you go and stand there and just come alone, you also go home alone without the PhD. <laughs> yes, sure. When you go to the PhD, you go with senior guys. That's why I've been telling you to read the top ranking journals in your area so that you know their people. 
Now, and I've told you right now, you are saying that it is, you know, let me ask you a question. So if you go into Viva and they ask you a question that this thing you are talking is about church is it not, uh, is it not uh, 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 for granite church? Do you do granite church? Why are you doing that? <laughs> if you are confused, your, your, your work is wrong. So, so, well, I would have been confused, bro. Honestly. Good. Have... Because, because you have not read divorce work. Divorce is a book. It is not even a publication. It's a book. I sat with divorce and say, yeah, read it in and out, underlined it. Oh, God. I remember. Printed it, underlined it, understood every statement in it. So go and read about the authors where all. And that's one of the things I'll tell you all, all of you. Whatever paradigm you come from, know the people in the paradigm and how they use the methods in your paradigm. For example, critical realism, how to use case study in critical realism is well explained by a gentleman called Easton, who is a marketer. Easton, and, and it's published in Elsevier. Easton, um, um, uh, 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 it's called a guide to using critical realism, doing a critical realism case study. And the case he talks about, even I don't even mention most of them because it will end up going, because you're not, most of you are not critical realists. It's too confusing. It's, I, don't, I want to make this one more general. But what I'm trying to point out is that you need to understand what you are doing. How can you use your interpretive researcher that you quote Jin to support your, why you are using case study? You are failed. Jin is a positivist, but he explained case study research. So you don't quote Jin to support your work when you are a, 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 a interpretive researcher. You quote Walsham. Walsham's views about qualitative research. And then you can support it to Cresswell because Creswell also talks about constructivism. Anyway, these are the tricks of the game. We'll talk about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Man. Anyway, I hope people have learned something. Yes, prof. <laughs> yes, prof. Yes, prof. And people have slept very well too throughout the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we're listening. <laughs> okay. Hey, your hands. Eh? I'm going to. I have to go. Uh, okay. Let's... <laughs> Um, Justice, you have asked, answered your question already. Sumani, what's the question? Prof, um, I noticed that in your work you are using we, we, we instead uh, of I. Yes. Uh, please, you have to choose what you want to do. That one, I can't say there's a particular formula for it. For example, I like working through that we can be used in two ways. Why you say that you are, you are trying to refer you and your supervisor. And then and then there's another way we use we to show that you you and the person who is reading your work, you're working together through the thesis. But some supervisors don't like this thing. They like you to depersonalize the thesis. So the, the thesis did the, the thesis. I see the thesis was got up and has legs and he went to collect data. <laughs> so I'm going to do the third person, the researcher, the researcher, the researcher. So I don't know what to work for you. you have to, whatever you choose, you have to be consistent. Do you understand me? I remember I was asking my PhD, my Viva to why am I using we a lot? And I said, it's a journey that I'm taking one. It's a journey I'm taking the reader and me through. So I call it we. So most of the time, at this time, we do this, we do that. Then I also, at the data collection, I, I recognize that my data collection was being informed, a uh, process was being informed by the notions and advice from my supervisor. So that's why I took a we approach. Well, be careful though, please. Like somebody went to Viva, they asked him, that, why are you saying this? Well, my supervisor told me I should do it. <laughs> I can't really feel because he, he, could, he couldn't even explain why he did something. He said, my supervisor said I should do it. Hmm. Okay, Basit. Yeah, Prof. Um, my question is, uh, is that, is there a generally accepted I mean, a sample size in terms of reaching saturation? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned that mm -hmm. you, you no, can't no, just no, do like no. four interviews of five no. and say you have achieved saturation. Is there any generally accepted sample size that? No, um, I'm asking your question. I said no. There's no generally accepted saturation. Is about you, the ability of the people to answer the question. And you are not getting any new answers anymore. So I can't be able to determine. You can even go to hundred and not get to your saturation. So it's your phenomenon. That you are studying, so I can't be prescriptive on that. But I told you that for a good qualitative research, if you have got divergent, diver, uh, diversity of respondents, and you have got um, you are triangulating very well, then between fifteen to twenty five is good for uh, every case that you are building. But it depends on the on the more uh, the complexity of the phenomenon. Sometimes, look at me. Just you are, you are doing a study on MTN, and you are trying to look at MTN holistically. MTN operates in four zones. So you may have to 
have data from each of the four zones. Each of the four zones, when you go there, you may talk to about six or seven people. So by the time you finish the four zones, you are multiplied by seven. So that gives you about 28 already before you even talk about head office. What about that? So next week, I'll show you data collection and show you how different respondents come together in triangulation to create um, um, a unique um, 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 a, a, unique, a unique point of saturation. The problem you have right now is that you don't know which question to ask which person. Every person, every questionnaire that you develop should be targeted at somebody. Anyway, let's end it here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much, bro. You, bro. And good night. Thank you, thank thank you, you very bro. much, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. Thank you. survey, what we try to do is that we try to study a, a population by selecting a sample from the population and questioning them. And there are different types of survey. There's male and self-administered questionnaire in which you self, you send the questionnaire to somebody, a personal address, complete the questionnaire himself. Then there's web-based survey. You actually put the survey on the internet, people will answer. That was cheaper, fastest, moderate response rate. But you can have bias because sometimes you're not very careful and you don't lock it to a particular ID. Some people may have have do multiple um, multiple responses of the same issue to to bias the conversation. So you may have the person who is log on with his phone and answer, and that, that same person will log on with his computer and answer. Who log on with his TV and answer. He will even log on with his iWatch and answer. By the time that by the time you realize, then go to his tablet and go to the uh, the the um, from, apart from tablet, go to the desktop, then go to the laptop. So one person has had seven different ways of answering the question can create biases in your data. So usually what others do is they tie the web survey to an ID. So in case you are part of a school, you have to use your ID so that the unique ID has taken the uh, web survey and you are, not, no, you are not allowed to do so again.
telephone interview is is only possible when the person who is conducting the interview has access to the people through interview or even SMS based um, service. What the person does is that he calls you this and then he asks you a number of questions on the phone. Um, but we always advise that on telephone and interviews, you want to reduce the number of questions because usually after about the seven questions, the person can't even remember the first question. Especially if you are trying to do multiple choice. To what extent do you agree with this issue? Is it A, this? Is it B, this? Is it C, this? Is it D, this? Can you imagine doing it over on the phone for 10 times? That means you have, you have read out 40 answers. Can you, and even the four answers, the first ones, if you read it, you are not very careful. The person may forget the question after you have read the answers. So it's, although it is fast and moderate course, it, it can also have moderate response rate because sometimes people may cut off and tell that they are tired, they can't continue. Okay. So the best is the in-person one where you go there and sit there and do it face, face to face. And that's quite common. And that's what sometimes some of you as PhD students will be doing for your work, face-to-face -face interviews, sit down with the person, interview the person. 